questions. Right. So, welcome everyone. This is uh, the third event from Considerations, a virtual seminar series uh, from Shonglab, Shonglab Journal of Literary and Cultural Enquiry. My name is Shorit Bhattacharya. I'm one of the editors of Shonglab. The other one, uh, Orko Chattopadhyay, will join us soon as well. So um, we are very happy to have this third seminar series, this third event on uh, digital pe pedagogy and the classroom uh, in higher education. And uh, just to talk about uh, briefly about what we thought about this uh, particular um, uh, sort of seminar series in the beginning and how we are sort of uh, taking it forward a few words about Shonglab and considerations so that we can sort of contextualize today's topic. And then I'll hand it over to Orko to say a few words about um, the topic today. And then we'll sort of move, move on with the discussions with the forum. So um, Shonglab is, was founded in 2014, January. Orko and I uh, were graduate students back then. And we wanted this journal to, to be peer reviewed from the beginning and by sort of biannual. And we also wanted to make sure that this journal um, chooses topics which are contemporary, cutting edge, and also uh, has a sense of urgency about them. And um, we have, we are very uh, fortunate to have a strong editorial board and been sort of maintaining the kind of rigor that is uh, required for a journal like that, a young but same time uh, sort of scholarly and um, in the last six or seven years we have managed to sort of put out a number of issues and uh, sort of volumes that we have done on topics that we have as on an editorial uh, level considered a sort of urgent or necessary be it sort of terror and terrorism or um, democracy uh, environmental humanities critiquing humanism um, sort of city and space and something that we have always wanted to maintain through this journal is that though we have tried to cut ages with other sort of disciplines and departments, we've also maintained that the literary must not be sacrificed in order to bring into the interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary fold into the debate. So that's something we have been trying to sort of maintain through this journal. And um, we're very fortunate at the same time that um, the journal has been running successfully, but we have also been able to sort of develop newer sort of fronts, newer strands to the journal. We have uh, added probably in 2017, we started with the review section, and then uh, later on we started. So um, sort of recently we have added a translation section as well, because we thought that you know translation from uh, lesser known authors, especially work by lesser known authors need to be sort of brought out. And this is something that the journal does. Uh, to sort of talk about things that have not been talked about widely and to sort of give a voice, give a platform to more young uh, sort of scholarly, early career scholars. So this is something that we have done and considerations to put it uh, into a context is a very recent development, especially in the context of the post COVID uh, crisis that we have all been going through, especially as educators, teachers, students that we have been going through and the transitions that we have faced the crisis, both on a personal level and on an academic level. So we, we thought that it could probably give us a better platform as um, sort of you know academics or educators to talk about the challenges that we are going through. And this is the third one. Previously, we spoke about uh, digital uh, education and online education in India, especially, uh, especially a digital divide, so to say. And then uh, there was another panel on solidarity and community building, uh, especially by early career uh, scholars. And this one is going to be on digital pedagogy. But at the same time, uh, to give you an understanding that we're also going to be including sort of authors and publishers and sort of reviewers and you know, people associated with academia or education or literature and culture in general to talk about maybe like individual standalone panels to talk about their sort of, um, you know, sort of the challenges that they are going through. So with this, I would like to sort of hand it over to Orko now. Uh, the other editor of Shonglab to sort of say a few words about today's uh, topic, and then we'll move on with uh, the host and the moderator, Dr. Onuporna Mukherjee. So from me, um, thank you so much for joining us and to all our speakers, welcome, and we look forward to this event today. Thank you.
I guess I'm here, right? Okay. So thank you so much, um, Shorit, for uh, setting the tone and and not leaving uh, that much for me to do or say, to be honest. So I think Shorit has al already introduced both the journal and the seminar series that we have just started. Uh, it's interesting that we began on a slightly general note with the first seminar that we did uh, on online education again. The second one was about this idea of community formation, especially in these times of separation, so to speak. And the third one here, we are specifically, uh, we, we want to talk about higher education and to what extent digital pedagogy can be used and in what ways for higher education. So just to open up this conversation very briefly from my end, uh, I would draw attention to a particular debate that has been uh, viewing in a way in, in India and I'm sure in other places too, uh, this whole question of, you know, recording lectures leading to, you know, possible crisis in terms of generating redundancy and also this idea of the digital divide, especially in a country like India, uh, to what extent is the digital divide bridged when we are talking about higher education and what is the sort of political, ethical, and social distinction we have to make when we talk about digital education in uh, primary, secondary level, and when we talk about digital education for doctoral studies, let's say, or higher level. Uh, again, uh, there was this debate about the, the, the way in which the web talks or the webinars were taking place in India, to what extent they were sometimes used as methods of bypassing classroom teaching and in a more positive sense can they be utilized as platforms to bring in uh, a wider transnational uh, forum let's say together uh, for doctoral studies for higher studies so i mean there has been a debate going on around the, the efficacy of the webinar and exactly in what way should it be utilized uh, I'm very happy to have this great panel here, which uh, also has representatives from different institutions, uh, different regions, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, I now hand it over to Professor Anuparna Mukherjee to do the rest. And welcome to all the panelists. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, I'm sure, what would be a very rich discussion. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shangla, for uh, giving us this platform. So we are back with the third panel of the series on the interfaces between the digital and the human. Uh, specifically in this pandemic-ridden context, it has established this ubiquity of the digital uh, in our everyday lives, and thereby kind of intensified certain pre-existing social chasms. So today we're going to focus on uh, the digital pedagogy in the classroom and the institutions of higher education. Now, earlier, uh, uh, you know, Agamben's cynicism about this COVID-19 being a pretext for intensifying and kind of increasingly sort of creating an increasingly pervasive diffusion of digital technologies, particularly invoked uh, online education as a part of this, what he called the technological barbarism. That, incar that kind of incarcerates us, imprisons us in a spectral stream. And that's what he says. Uh, now, this evocation of the digital as a carceral space is almost articulated as a swan song to the very idea of university education and concomitantly uh, the notion of studenthood. And I would like to quote Agamben here. This is what he says, that to be a student entailed, first of all, a form of life in which studying and listening to lectures were certainly decisive features, but no less important, were encounters and constant exchanges with other scholars who often came from remote places who gathered together according to their place of origin and nations. Anyone who is taught in a university classroom knows well how in front of one's very eyes, friendships are made and according to their cultural and political interests, small study and research groups are formed that continue even after the classes have ended. All this, which had lasted for almost 10, century, uh, 10 centuries, now ends forever. Students will no longer live in the cities where their universities are located. Instead, 
they will listen to lectures closed up in their rooms and sometimes separated by hundreds of kilometers from those who were formerly their classmates. Now, Agamben's view uh, you know, became viral, and while he was partially criticized for upholding a, a paranoid and perhaps an extreme position, nonetheless, you know, the debates around homing the digital and then, of course, these various forms of exclusion and unbelonging have gained a new currency in these exigent situations with you know, certain concerns about this disproportionate accessibility, particularly in, in a country like India, where we have a very vast and uneven you know, the democracy. So however, having said that, today we're not going to simply limit ourselves to the problems of the digital divide, but broaden our scopes to embrace the role of the digital in humanistic education with a desire to address equally significant questions about engaging the students or effecting social changes in the classroom. So we we'll look into various participatory structures, uh, policies, and personal experiences of using digital tools and infrastructures with teaching and research. So our panel brings together academics from various institutes of higher education in India to reflect on classroom pedagogy and in virtual platforms. Now, uh, these people have actually worked with the digital modes and technologies prior to the COVID situation, so they have a certain nuanced understanding of some of the concerns that we are grappling with right now. Uh, so within a larger framework, we hope to ask these questions. To whom does online teaching cater and how can we kind of democratize it? How do we negotiate with different economies of power? And finally, how digital humanities could be taught in India as an emerging field to bolster the production of knowledge through a use of creative pedagogy? It is my pleasure to have with me uh, Dr. Aditi Singh from Aizam Bhopal, Dr. Dibuduti Roy from IIM Indore, uh, Dr. Maya Dodd from Flame University, Pune, and Prayag Roy from St. Xavier's University, Dr. Prayag Roy from St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. I am Onuparna Mukherjee from Aizam Bhopal, uh, again, uh, the moderator for today's session. So we'll move to our first panelist, Dr. Aditi Singh. I'll kind of introduce her briefly, and then I'll hand over uh, the space to Aditi. Uh, Dr. Aditi Singh is currently Assistant Professor of English and Philosophy at the Indian Institute of Science, Research, uh, Science Education and Research, Bhopal. She has previously taught philosophy at St. Stephen's College and Hindu College and the University of Delhi. She did an MA and PhD in Critical Theory at the University of Nottingham. Uh, her work draws insight from literature, philosophy, psychoanalysis, political theory, history, cultural studies, mathematics, and music. Her research primarily revolves around the problem of subjectivity and action, particularly in so far these are implicated in the political ramifications of the formation, use, and transformation of philosophical concepts. At Aysa Bhopal, she offers courses intended both for those interested in specializing in philosophy, literature, or critical theory, and for those with general interest in the wider cultures associated with the study of humanities and social sciences. Welcome, Aditi. Over to you. Um, thank you, Anuparna, for the very lovely introduction. And um, thank you, Sharatena Orko, for inviting me to this um, uh, to well to the sunglob really I can I can rant for hours on this question I'll try and keep it to 15 minutes you know otherwise Anuparna will kick me out um, so um, this is something that I have actually you know been thinking about quite a lot um, digital education and digital ped pedagogy in the last well last few months of course but uh, education in general and as Anuparna said that you know I, I've had I've done sort of online classes and, and not necessarily as a teacher, you know, also as a student because I've never stopped studying. So I, I've done language courses and I've, I have reading groups that have been running for a couple of years, which are online. And um, I've, I've really been thinking a lot about um, how can I bring my sort of the ideals I would like to have in a classroom in education when I have, let's say, a little more power as a teacher. And that's also something I do want to talk about. So uh, before I go into the particular problems of the digital as I've seen it, I do want to talk about uh, what I sort of, you know, what I would understand by education in the first place, you know, what I would, or rather what I would want from education uh, in the first place. Um, so uh, I, 
from you know the many sort of i think nearly 15 years of experience of teaching in different sort of spaces um the biggest obstacle that i found to learning and i'm not just talking about you know teaching but also as a student is actually hierarchy you know hierarchies in the classroom which i i feel do make learning impossible because you know when when i'm placed as a teacher let's say you know all knowing you know i have i have studied everything i'm there to narrate to tell and uh, the students are there to to sort of receive my fount of knowledge um there's there's an immediate alienation that occurs in that in that space in that con context because knowledge becomes something static something uncreative you know it, it it becomes a possession you know it is a possession that i have which uh, i'm trying to sort of you know transfer to students who probably are paying for it you know and it's it's this private property that is then you know being sort of exchanged in this 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 market and um which means that we are all you know producers consumers you know there, there's some kind of an, a commodification of education that happens of of knowledge that happens and which means that education itself becomes a kind of very market process if 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 that happens and that's something that i've been you know really struggling with you know since i and and in the beginning when i taught and i did private tutoring i remember when i was still in 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 college and it it was always free you know i i you know and and that that sort of um but even there there was some kind of a you know feeling of well at that time i was still teaching people who were um who were in, in a sense my my colleagues you know my there, there was not that level of hierarchy that entered but as soon as i sort of you know got this degree and became a teacher uh, there, there, there was this divide that entered and that that hierarchy would just stop things from happening and so i tried to find ways around it um mainly influenced by at that time i had been reading so during my doctoral studies when i was thinking about education i, I was reading paulo freire quite a lot and you know uh, he was mentioned in in the in the talk description um and um of gramsci and i started thinking through you know um freire and gramsci about what kind of could we have some way of having education that is transformative dynamic and you know which would reduce alienation which would and 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 at, at the same time without you know letting me fall into the trap of thinking of myself as you know a teacher who knows and you know who is able to transfer you know some knowledge that i have which i i'm pretty sure i don't because knowledge is not static so maybe i've read like you know the whatever reading we have chosen for that class let's say you know maybe i've read it you know twice and the student might have read it once you know but like the third time when we talk in the classroom about it you know is is a third reading and it's a new reading for me as well so um how do i how do i get this across in a structure that is so hierarchical and when i have this power really of um of marks let's say you know i'm i'm, I'm marking the student and you know they 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 are they are dependent upon me so like in delhi university actually it was pretty good because i wasn't i i completely disavowed you know exams are outside marking is outside i have nothing to do with it you do your own thing and what we're going to do in class is going to be something completely different and then we in in um, um hindu and then mo mostly in st stephens when i was teaching there so we had like a little bit of leeway i think it was about 20 marks let's say in in those terms where we could find our own way of teaching and in which what i thought was you know to use um this gramshian method so gramshi in um in the prison notebooks in one of the texts i don't remember where he says that you know learning takes place through a spontaneous and autonomous effort of the pupil and he says that um with with the teacher fun exercising the function only of a friendly guide right so a teacher should not be more than a friendly guide and then he says um let me see if i can find this quote actually that'd be great and um then he says that to discover a truth oneself without external suggestions or assistance is to create even if the truth is an old one it demonstrates the mastery of the method and indicates that in any case one has entered the phase of intellectual maturity in which one may discover new truths so you know with inspired by this idea of you know research in the sense of you know the student being allowed to uh, 
you know, be unequal in that way. You know, like they are researching and I'm researching and then we are in this one space in a classroom discussing. But does allow me, you know, it does allow all of us some space to 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 learn, you know, and then and then, you know, I would connect it really to the third thesis on Feuerbach by Marx, where he says, when he talks about education and he says, well, the materialist doctrine, and you know, I can probably quote it from memory, concerning the changing of circumstances and upbringing forgets that circumstances are changed by humans, by men, I think, and uh, that the educator themselves must be educated. And then he asks, you know, um, how do we understand these changing circumstances? And he says it is only revolutionary practice. But you know what is what 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 would we understand by re revolutionary practice in a classroom is something that you know I, I really really struggled to sort of to to find, and um, I'm I'm still working on it. And you know um, so Marcel Garnet, this French sociologist, uh, sociologist, said this very cool thing about method. Uh, he said that. Uh, method is, and I'm translating, is a road once you have traveled across it. You know, so that is that is the method, is the road once you've traveled across it. Um, but, you know, while thinking about it, the other problem that comes in comes from, like, you know, Heraclitus, who, whom I'll paraphrase and say, that you cannot step onto the same road twice, right? So so you're, you're at the beginning of the road, and the road is constantly changing, there are new obstacles. And, and so the problem then, is how do we find, you know, a creative pedagogy in a classroom? And I know I haven't really, I might have like just 10 minutes left, but I haven't, I'll, I'll try and get to the digital part of it soon. Uh, so the, the question is to find a kind of creative participatory pedagogy where I am not alienated. And if I'm not alienated, also the students are not alienated, you know, because it's not just, you know, in a hierarchical system that the students are alienated and can't learn. Uh, also, you know, the teacher becomes static. It's like the master and slave dialectic in Hegel, you know, like it, it, it's like the, the master loses out, you know, pretty much like probably much more than the slave. And, uh, you know, like it doesn't transfer exactly onto teachers and students, but, you know, the students do lose out, but so does the teacher. You know, I become this kind of a static person, you know, some some robot, as I said, you know, I could you could take 10 recordings of my lecture and then put them online and then just sort of kick me out, you know, I'll go do something else. Um, what, what do you need me for if, you know, there is no transformation, also my transformation going on in the classroom? And um, the classroom itself, you know, the, the space of the classroom, um, in, a, in, a, in a classroom where we are in, in, in together, you know, the question is, how is the space divided? A class, the word comes from, uh, I think, Latin classes, which means fleet or army. And, 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 and the, the, the idea of class has always been an idea of rank, of order. Uh, and, and so in a classroom, one of the things that, first things that one, needs to start thinking about is how can we break that order? How do we destroy it? And and in a classroom, if all the seats are fixed, which they are in some of our classrooms, it's it's very difficult. But then there, we still have classrooms where we can, you know, actually take the chairs and put them in a circle and then get them together. And and, and in the digital space, actually, that, that becomes slightly easier. Uh, well, so long as we don't have 70 people in the classroom, which well, which is what happened to me last semester, I had 77 students and then I was like, okay, you know, I don't know how we, we are going to uh, divide it in a way that makes it equal. But if, if it's a manageable online classroom, and that's a policy thing, you know, we can we can maybe put everybody in a circle and we can get together and we can still try and have this discussion. We can, um, the, the point is about also thinking of how There might be a slight lag, I believe, in Aditi's video. I think Aditi is sort of frozen for the moment. Okay. We, we might for a turning off our videos if that helps. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I'm happy to if that helps. Uh, sure. I, in fact, Onupanadi is frozen as well. So um, she's visible to me actually. Yeah, she's, she's visible, quite visible, but yeah, I but can the, see her. Aditi, we can't. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, I can't uh, 
I mean, I can see them, but it's sort of frozen. Ah, Onupornadi is back. Right. Aditi is back as well now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, the the problems of the digital. You know, I mentioned it, and it said, okay, out. <laughs> you know. Um, so um, yeah, I I was in a in a flow, and I'm not sure what I was talking about now. Um, okay. So um, okay now. Just sort of to summarize, you know, this whole thing that I was going on about in the classroom and pedagogy. So um, I would say that, you know, how I understand education would be, um, you know, like a, a sort of, you know, creation of collective humanity in that space and not really a class, you know, not really a rank and order with, you know, a leader and, you know, like, or, or all the education itself is the idea of leading forth, but leading forth in the sense of a friendly guide, you know, and, and you don't think of a friendly guide as somebody who, uh, you know, to, to reduce the amount of hour that, you know, the teacher has on the student in that sense, it, it, it's a difficult issue. Um, well, I was, I was talking about emancipatory education and can we make education emancipatory? And that uh, applies to all kinds of education, not, not just digital. And let me sort of, you know, I, I, I'm, I'll try and think through in the next five minutes. Anuparna, how much time do I have? Um, okay, in the next five, you yeah, have five in minutes. the next few minutes, I'll try and five think of, um, you know, what, what, what the digital adds or does or changes. Um, so the, the thing about um, digital education is that it, it both allows for um, a kind of equality of space and sort of makes it impossible in some ways. Uh, because in a, in a normal classroom with all the students there, of course, you know, ignoring the, you know, already existing inequalities that lead some students to be in the classroom and some to not. But once students are in the classroom, um, you want me to switch off the audio? Well, video, sorry. Um, if that helps, you I can. I, I, you can. Is it not working anymore? I think it's. You're, you're perfectly audible. You're perfectly audible. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll you're just continue. Audible. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, what was I going on about? I got distracted by the messages. I'm frozen on video. Hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry about this. Um, you're perfectly audible. You're, you're, you're audible. kind of your uh, audio. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, please give me a second. And am I moving? Yes, sir, you're fine. <laughs> Everything is fine. <laughs> All right. Except now I've completely forgotten what I was talking about. But okay, let's. I'll, I'll just restart. You know, I think I think that's one one other thing about method is that you know we are always recommencing. You know, a road is renewed, dynamic, emergent, and so that means that we are always new. Um, and you've all disappeared, so I'm just assuming that you're all still here. Uh, so the thing about the the, the digital step is that um, it it sort of makes clear certain inequalities which might not have been clear in the classroom. You know, in the classroom, all the students are there and um, with everyone together, at least, you know, there are hierarchies between the teacher and the student and you can't tell the class differences between the students very clearly, or at least, you know, I, I have not been able to. Uh, what happens with the digital is that you know that some people are definitely more privileged. You know, some people have laptops like the one I'm using right now. Uh, some people have, you know, uh, better quality phones, bigger screens. Some people are stuck with small screens. Some people have no screens at all. And um, this makes it almost sort of, you know, impossible to reach across everybody equally. Aditi, can you hear us? Yeah, did you ask? Yeah, I'm here. Aditi is frozen again. Um, yeah, Aditi is frozen. We'll wait for her for two minutes. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. I think the internet is actually that's fine. That's pretty strange. That's, you know. It's an illustration yeah. of what you're saying. Yeah. Illustration of what I'm saying, exactly. <laughs> you know, so so though I am you know, amongst the more privileged with you know a nice Wi-Fi connection and uh, this the, a laptop and you know all the nice devices to help me teach um, or learn. You know, depending on you know which situation I'm in. But then there are students who may actually not have you know even a proper a phone. They may not have anything except their um, four, 3G connection or 4G connection. They might be in a village where even that connection is very doubtful. They might uh, not be able to afford to pay so much. So, so this. Um, sorry. Uh, so the so the problem with the whole uh, digital divide is is something that. You know, is is in some ways. I mean, uh, um, I mean, apart from like a revolution, you know, insurmountable, uh, at least from our end. But you know, at the same time, if we can just the the the, uh, the solution that I could temporarily find was to um, it was this exact thing of you know changing everything I thought about how teaching should be done, and uh, to think of how we could have recordings, we could have. Things that you know could be accessed by students whenever they could, um, in which we could have creative, we could have spaces where we could all interact, the teacher and the students, without putting so much you know pressure on everybody to have a big screen. Um, and and this this makes me think of you know sometimes you know I have I want to attend lectures and I can't because you know I want to attend lectures which are happening in another time zone and and this is not something that's Corona virus sort of situation induced I've been doing it for the last three or four years there there are these um, and uh, the fact that I can find recordings of lectures that I might have wanted to attend that I can get them on my system I can listen to them while walking you know so it, it, this makes it digital and the digital the actual meaning of it the touch you know the digits the fact that you know I, I they are they're at my fingers let's say you know to to use that interlinguistic pun uh, it, the, the the fact of the possibility of having things you know at hand um, it, it really does change the possibilities of you know gaining that education now now it it sort of sorts out one issue so um, the, the issue of you know the current students not being able to access it is one and the issue of you know the vast, vast majority of the population not being to being able to access higher education is the other so it may be causes some problems in you know my immediate classroom but in in the in the wider sector perhaps people have more things at hand, they have more sort of, you know, possibilities of listening, of working through, um, of understanding, of, of, of interact, of knowing that, the, you know, there, there are other people who think this way. And also um, these little reading groups and classrooms that could be formed, uh, which do not, which do not depend on the privilege of belonging to a particular institute. I, I am part of a couple of these reading groups and I'll, and I'll finish in two minutes because I think I ate my five minutes by digital okay. problems. Yes. Wind up. Uh, so so um, I'll wind up by sort of talking about just two things. One would be my, uh, and, and now I'm coming to my actual experience of teaching, you know, uh, in COVID times and before that, uh, my experience of online teaching learning. So with 77 students in my classroom, it was, um, I was terrified. I had no idea how to sort of, you know, uh, include everybody. And even in a normal classroom, I wasn't very happy to have 77 students, I have to say, because I felt like I could not include everybody. And that inevitably happens you know you can you can try and call out people and you can try and get everybody to talk but there are only some people who would you know volunteer and and it's it's also not very nice to sort of you know call people out and say hey you haven't been talking answer you know that 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 will make anybody feel uncomfortable i wouldn't like it if somebody does that to me so um, there is the issue of you know a kind of voluntary participation which which excludes people who are not confident or who are not comfortable with uh, with voluntarily participating in a huge class, which sort of gets exacerbated on the digital platform where then you have these 60 people in that classroom who have the videos of, audios of, you call them, they don't answer. And then you have these 10 people who are constantly interacting and talking to you. And then what I tried to do was that I, I you know, the lecturing part, I, I sort of recorded and put online. And I said, well, you can watch it whenever you want, not watch it if you feel like you're, you have your 
books and that that is enough but you know it'd be nice if you watch it and uh, the classroom would be used for problem solving as such i was teaching logic so you know it was a different different way of teaching in any case and in which you know we had problems that i i sort of sat and solved on uh, and and uh, displayed and then i, I would elicit on the next step and i tried to get them to participate in that way but it was just very frustrating and I was very bored. I'm not sure, like if I was bored, I'd, maybe the students were also as bored as I was. Uh, it was it was, a, it was a strange experience of teaching. But, you know, before that, I've had like smaller classrooms in which uh, we've, we've had these um, reading groups of a sort in which we have some text that we have read together and, uh, or rather we've read by ourselves and the, the space, the online space is just for discussion. It's for, and and it it really did not feel very very different from a classroom in person. I have to say, if you know, and and this of course happened more at a you know like a PhD level stage. But if you know, um, and all of us have read the text, then I, as I said, you know this this in fact, um, unlike a classroom where I'd be standing in front and everybody would be around, you know, uh, here everybody's already around, and and which meant that uh, the the digital allowed us to to share a kind of space that looks equal at least, and like like the one right now, where um, I did not feel as much as it as a teacher but more as what for example you know anuparna is right now and she's moderating the discussion but uh, we're all going to be talking and discussing though it was more of a not everybody didn't have 15 minutes we were all talking through and and that kind of a thing really did um you know i i sort of did not feel it was too far away from a uh, teaching in a normal classroom and um i would still say that i haven't found you know the the, the answer the method uh, as i said you know the it's still the beginning of the road and um to sort of finish with gramsci again you know when he talks about democracy he says that democracy must mean that every citizen can govern and that society places them in a general condition to achieve this right and and so that's what i would say that you know if, uh, and if I think of democratic education, I would say democratic education must mean that you know every every student, every every student, including the teacher, feels like they have achieved some level of mastery of their thinking, and they 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 feel like they are they have uh, you know they, they they are they have autonomy of thought. Let's put it that way you know, rather than mastery, they have, they have achieved a certain level of autonomy of thought and that this, the, that the educational structures, the systems have put them in a place where they can feel that they, they, they are ready to discover new things and to, uh, and, and to do that autonomously and through, through their own methods. So I'll stop uh, here because as I said, you know, the digital problems also caused me to run over time a bit but i'll be happy to sort of discuss a bit more at the end you know once the question answer start and i'm really glad that other people will be talking after me and improving on what i say um so please take this clap on the digital medium <laughs> yeah. a digital clap yeah. but that looks like a slow clap too yeah i'm trying <laughs> So Great. thank you, Aditi. Despite the digital disruption, you know, you created a very strong uh, conceptual rubric. So I, I think that will kind of help us to kind of, uh, you know, take in some of the other issues. Um, and and uh, I really like the way you kind of folded the needed within the larger political, uh, you know, or philosophical context. So we'll now uh, move on to the next speaker. The, uh, let me kind of very quickly brief the audience about the format. We're going to let the speaker speak. Uh, you know, and, and after we are done with the first round of deliberations, we're going to take the questions together. But what you can do is actually type the questions in the chat box or just, you know, hold them for some time. And, and then we can kind of take them during the Q&A. So but, but please keep typing your questions in the chat box. I think that will help. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dibodupi Roy, a friend of... Uh, through whom I have known for nearly two decades now, 16, 17 years. And he has taken full advantage of that and has given me um, a WhatsApp introduction. I, I wanted, I, I made the mistake of asking for a formal introduction uh, and, and he has given me a WhatsApp bio note. So let me read that out. 
Uh, Dr. Debudati Roy's public facing and interdisciplinary scholarship is wide ranging from new media theory to post colonial digital humanities, with a core in recovering subaltern subjectivities in the global south through facilitating reciprocal conversations between creative communities and cultural policymakers. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the Indian Institute of Management, IIM, Indore. He is the co-founder of the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, uh, as we call, we call them, Dharti. And, and we, I know for a fact that Dharti is doing wonderful you know, work uh, for the past few years. So we are very, very keen on listening to you, Dibbo. Over to you. Thank you. I hope my uh, I'm audible and my screen is visible to everyone. If just give me a yes. Yes. Is, yeah. So I hope my PowerPoint is visible. Um, uh, no, 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 I'll have to add, add it just a second. Yeah, if you could kindly. All good, Dibya. All good, wonderful. Yeah. Right, so uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Anuparna. Um, I've been teaching four courses uh, concurrently, which is my excuse for the WhatsApp introduction. I have only about 70 sessions in 42 days to teach on a digital media, uh, where I'm also trying to do work on Dharti as well. But it's an absolute privilege to be part of this wonderful, wonderful panel. And my uh, thanks to Anuparna, Orko, and Shori for organizing what I see as very important conversations. And, um, you know, my, I have colleagues here who are co-workers on Dharti, uh, Maya, Professor Maya Dodd, uh, who, who's going to talk about Dharti in more detail. Today, I'm going to let off on talking about that. But let me first start by acknowledging where uh, Aditi ended and uh, just begin by saying thank you, Aditi, for bringing back um, Gramsci into the conversation. My talk today is titled DH Pedagogy is Dead, Long Live DH Pedagogy, Reflections from Teaching DH in Indian Management Classrooms. And uh, very honestly, I do not uh, subscribe to Anglo-American epistemes of DH, which is why my DH looks very different from the structures of DH that might be talked about in DH research and uh, pedagogical circles in the US or the UK or in the global north. So in that way, I feel that DH pedagogy is dead we need to find ways to talk about DH pedagogy in the current context and where Aditi ended with the Gramscian model um, and not really ended but opened the conversation for all of us. I would like to upfront say this that I see DH in India as inherently rhizomatic, rhizomatic in the very delusion and the Guattarian term. It has no primary root, it has no secondary root, it just starts like ginger at separate places. You don't need to self-identify as digital humanist to become a DH person. Or a DH teacher. So that's that's the key point that I'm going to start off with. And one major, major uh, takeaway, which uh, I mean, sort of a nice thread from Aditi scholarship to sort of my presentation today, is that I am going to focus on how infrastructures and locations determine access and practices. So infrastructures and affordances and the kind of locations we are in, how they determine humanistic practices is one of going to be my one of my key sort of spiels for today. I'm going to start off on uh, an interesting note by acknowledging the diversity of digital pedagogy signifies across the country. Many of you might have seen this. This was on June 20th, where the very unfortunate event of a 16 year old student committing suicide after failing to attend online classes, which was absolutely heartbreaking. And on the same note, there seems to be Google to deploy e-classroom tools in one lakh Maharashtra schools for free. We just came out on the 7th of August, which was day before. Uh, day, uh, day before. So this is the state of primary education. I am starting by acknowledging the absolute divide in terms of access, right, which exists in my country, especially in primary education. But today's topic is on higher education. So let's look at what higher education does. It seems higher education is functioning on a better signified. There's SWAM, which is the MOOCs platform from the Government of India, MHRD. There's NEET. There's FOSI. There's CC Consortium for Educational Communication. There's NPTA. So, for example, it seems that higher education is doing far better in terms of providing both access as well as multiple ways of both asynchronous and synchronous access. So, it seems higher education is doing better. 
but it seems if you just look at this carefully it suddenly seems that higher education seems to be all technological right so there's a focus on technological education or technical education what we understand to be uh, engineering and the and, and the sort of uh, vocational disciplines right vocational in the terms of they lead to a job immediately that's the understanding or signify so that would make us feel that you know engineering might must be the most popular undergraduate discipline in this country well you will be surprised right so even this article that comes out in hindustan times on august 2nd says as science gains ground fear students opting for mb engineering so it almost seems to say that you know science is doing the best amongst all of the undergraduate subjects if you just go down and scroll down the article you realize that the maximum number of students who study uh, you know the, the highest number of students in this country who join a particular discipline is in the humanities is actually 40.2% of people who are in the humanities as you can see this is the all india survey for higher education 2018-19 which says maximum numbers of students are enrolled in ba programs and sadly it is just noted as arts but i believe arts here is a signified for humanities and social sciences but anyway we'll just take ba as the overarching framework so there's about uh, I think the 93 lakh is the number of people who who enroll in undergrad humanities programs. So when there's such a focus on humanities at the underground level, um, but just to let you know, out of the 93 lakh, there's only one or two percent who ultimately go on to do a research degree or a PhD. So there seems to be a disproportion, right? Disproportion in the focus. While focus is on humanities at the undergrad level, somehow the technological structures are focused on engineering, which is not a bad thing. but it just seems to make that division between the binary between the humanities and the sciences and the engineering so stark and that's a binary i want to contest right because digital humanities is known as an array of convergent practices and i will come to that a little later but this is the binary this is that uh, siloed structure of education in our country which uh, thankfully some of the policies of the new education nep uh, sort of address all the implementation seems to be uh, will will be seen right that's that's the key question but that's one of the areas i would like to talk about so i have no i have no specific questions but have some provocations right so i my provocations are to the context for digitality in india i will define digitality don't worry i will talk about the case for dh pedagogy as humanities pedagogy and i'm hoping this will take right you know um, it lead to some engaging questions and then i'm going to talk about media studies for dh and dh for media studies or media studies as dh and dh as media studies which is the the discipline that i used to access digital humanities in my institution uh, and reflections about dh pedagogy from the management classroom where i'm going to share some student projects for the last 4 years i have been at i am indoor for the last 4 years in the department of communication which also allows me a unique vantage point because i don't belong to the department of humanities and social sciences or a department of literature per se which is not to sort of say that those have specific signifies but communication because it's a relatively new area or um, department in this country gives me certain certain privileges and affordances which probably those departments might not have provided so i want to start with the idea for the context for digitality in india how do i define digitality and this goes back to my first slide right the signify right the digitality i define as the realization of digital platforms and online affordances within specific relational contexts so particularly and these are this is limited but i see these four as four very key relational uh, situations or or uh, you know uh, knowledge systems or epistemes that define digitality caste class gender and colonialism and to talk about what they do how they can influence cyber cyberspace well online spaces are also predicated depending on what the offline spaces do so forms of control and regulation as less success are already embedded in operational code that govern our interactions in cyberspace so offline interactions really do color online interactions that's a very key point so next i'm going going to go into this idea of dh pedagogy as humanities pedagogy so this is the first uh, thing that comes to your mind when you think about dh which is that distant reading model that comes from moretti's famous essay in 2011 it actually has a, a longer history but people look at this particular essay as the beginning of distant reading in the current framework of when he did uh, analysis of uh gonzago's murder and he talked about uh, the conversations as uh, this particular characters as nodes and the conversations as edges or uh, so these he like he realized that uh, moretti realized that you know these were the main characters involved in the particular scene now the question is why do we need this is called distant reading where you read from a 30000 point of 30000 feet point of view right 
So many might question that when well, the number of books is finite, right? Why do we need distant reading? You know, our literary humanistic analysis is doing fine with close reading, which goes back to Aditi's point about close reading as a methodology. Right? People often forget, like when when they talk of the humanities, what's your methodology? Is the question we are asked. Well, close reading is a methodology. If you forget that, you know, that's a problem. But the problem then when we say that books are finite is you are right. It's absolutely correct. Books are indeed finite. But the number of the books in the world is not infinite. 50 to 60 million books in the world with the various libraries holding. However, uh, books in machine readable form will have its impact on humanistic studies, which is one of my main fields. As such collections become available, we we'll develop the tools with which to read or not read them. That choice should be given to us. When there is 50 or 60 million books, we should be given the choice to close read it as well as not to close read it. So the goal of distant reading is not to use the machine to supplant human judgment, but to see if the machine classifications provoke new insight amongst a body of familiar texts. Now, this also assumes, and that's going to be my next slide, that if there are 50 to 60 million books, there are about 1.72 billion websites. Now, imagining that books are the only site for knowledge production and dissemination, I believe would be necessarily a false uh, sort of a false episteme, right? The print, the print paradigm is, is the question that leads to this question. Does DH pedagogy imply the demise of traditional humanities pedagogy based in print based close, close reading methodologies? We have to also remember that print is also pretty new. It's not, you know, it's not a you know, very old, old paradigm of knowledge dissemination. It's pretty new. If you go back to earlier times, there were copper plates, there was Burjapatras. So this is also a very new paradigm, but we have imagined that print is the only paradigm that leads to knowledge production and dissemination, which then leads us to this question. And my answer is no, we don't need to give away close reading, but we need to deconstruct assumptions born out of the print paradigm and actively acknowledge the knowledge networks and media forms do not begin or end with the printing press. Also, we do not we need to not allow definitional debates about the age to hamper our teaching of what constitutes the humanistic tradition based in cultures of conversation. So I'm going to justify what cultures of conversation are. Humanities should provoke new questions. Humanistic inquiry should provoke new questions and create cultures of conversation. And we should not let definitional debates about what is the age. And that's an archetype. That's a very tried sort of structure in the age. It's been going on for a while that what is the age, right? The time is passed beyond that. In, in fact, we can teach distant reading alongside close reading and do not worry about proving how revolutionary the former is. Distant reading has been there for a very long time, from the early 19th century, if not, if not earlier. Right. So we don't need to create that binary between should we do distant reading? Should we do close reading? Depends on the research question. What's your research question? What do you want to find out? Depending on that, you can do distant reading. You can do close reading. And this is where I'm coming to the digital pedagogy part. Right. You can do distant reading. You can do close reading methodologically. But what is most important to understand is that locations determine humanistic practices as well. So how I teach the humanities depends on the location I am in. For the same reason that digital humanities might look, must look, not might look, must look very different in my country. Must also means that digital humanities pedagogy must look very different in my country. And therefore, what that does for digital pedagogy is one of the key questions that we are trying to provoke here. Right. So this, this is a this is a quick slide to tell you where I'm coming in from. I'm coming in today from my position as a media studies scholar. I but I see there are three large, broad um, sort of topical headings under which we can group digital humanities. And this is again falling into the trap of creating a canon. But this canon I'm to justify my version of this canon. I use this canon from this uh, conversation by Elijah Meeks, who had said that what is digital humanities? when you bring digital tools, techniques and objects to traditional humanistic enquiry. So for me, when you bring digital techniques, you are a computational humanist. When you bring digital tools, you're a digital archivist. And when you bring, look at objects, you're a multimodal cultural scholar. The, con the connection, because they're in a circle, it means that you can do a, a project can have all three versions of this coming together. But at least in this particular case, I'm looking at my pedagogy from the position of a multimodal cultural scholar who expands the scope and reach of the field of DH. She aims to produce work that reconfigures the relationships among author, reader, and technology simultaneously as a platform, a medium, and a visualization device. This is going to be key, and I'm happy to come back to these at any point of time with questions. Right. So now the question is 
when I say media studies as DH and DH as media studies, is that a new intervention? No, it's been there since 2009, if not earlier. There was this cinema journal uh, 40, uh, 2009 issue that came out, which talked about how media studies and digital humanities must be conversing amongst each other. And interestingly, the, the special issue was on digital scholarship and pedagogy. So I see fun, digital ped pedagogy being fundamental to digital humanities. Right? Digital humanities cannot exist in at least the spaces that I inhabit without digital ped without uh, pedagogy. Right? So pedagogy is key to digital humanities in the global south and in India for sure. So uh, it took about 10 years or about nine years for the next substantial conversation piece to come out, which was the Routledge Companion to Media Studies and Digital Humanities that comes out in 2018. And Gentry says does a fantastic job of getting together a large number of intersectional intersectional ideas, and intersectional viewpoints on digital humanities and media studies. And he talks about there is a lack of dialogue. He, he sort of acknowledges the lack of dialogue in the first two pages of the introduction. And he says this lack of dialogue is explained because digital humanities studies texts from the 1800s while, uh, which is basically because they're largely based in literature departments, which have a focus on the canon. And in media studies, we need, teach, need tend to focus more on new media and non-textual forms, it's just sounds, images, videos, and games. Now, I'll tell you where I come from. I teach at a management institution, um, while, uh, which also means that often while I have to fight to create specific signifies of the subjects, I also do not need to bring any particular baggage or canon about a particular subject or discipline into the classroom. So that advantage allows me to access. Yeah, that allows me to access a DH pedagogy, which is relatively independent of how we understand digital humanities in most contexts, which is largely from a literary studies background, which without denying the value of literary studies, digital humanities cannot only be a signified for computational literary studies. Digital humanities must be a signified for much more than CLS or computational literary studies. I talked about this uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago at the ADHO conference, which is also virtual. You can go and check that out on YouTube as well. So I'm just going to give you a quick background as to what I see reflected in DH pedagogy in the management classroom to be. It should be a pedagogy that transforms the uncertainties of the digital realm into the domain of questions. It should focus on critical thinking, commitment, community, and play. It should focus on how platforms are a discursive resting point, which must be critiqued. And platforms sanction and sanctify a particular state of things. And not finally, but another key important point, it talks of mapping as interpretation. Now, I've shown you, I've just got screenshots of two sort of assignments, which I give to students in my class. And uh, I am indoor, I'm very privileged to uh, teach both undergraduate and postgraduate students. We're one of the only IIMs to have an undergraduate a population which is the IPM program, wonderful program we have. And so I teach a, a course called Media Literacy in the IPM program, and I teach a course called Managing Media Matters at the PGP level. Uh, these are along with the other managerial communication, business communication basic courses that I teach. So this is an elective course, both are elective courses. And I've chosen these two particular assignments because I hope they'll allow uh, the projects arising from them will allow me to make the larger point that I'm making. So as you can see, the, the media literacy project is focused on curation because curation of technological resources of platforms is something, even though our students might be digital natives, they might not know the politics of those digital platforms. So for this particular assignment, if you are able to see the screen, you could say that I've talked about curation and with a focus on the audience. And I had given them the topic fundamental rights guaranteed by the Indian constitution. And they were supposed to interpret it, right? Interpretation of how they did it, as well as the platform on which they were being, they were interpreting it was both part of the classroom deliverables, uh, deliverables in the terms of not a hierarchy, but deliverables in the term of what can start a conversation for the PGP, which is the postgraduate program MBA. What I did was I decided that this curation might not be as effective a pedagogical platform or project. So I, I decided to give them the idea of story maps, right? So this uh, beautiful quote from Brené Brown, it says, stories are just data with soul. Uh, so I asked them to uh, you know, create story maps on specific topics. And you can't see this here, but the focus for this uh, particular class was the projects were supposed to be on identity, how media, how we mediate identities on platform. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, my uh, PDF right now. And I'm going to start sharing screen for um, showing some projects.
please let me know if there's any problem in seeing the projects okay so i'm just going to share um onupan i've just shared one yeah. um, tab yeah. is that visible yes yes i'll add to the stream and if you could also gradually wind up that sure. would also help yeah like yeah just absolutely i have the last two slides then. sure so yeah so this is this is um, is the stream visible to everyone hopefully yes yes okay wonderful so this was the interpretation of the fundamental rights this was done on aadhaar right to privacy and this was a traditional blog and I'm, i'm going to talk about the projects if needed in the question and answer because we are limited time if that was done on a blog this was right to freedom that was done on omeka which is again an open source platform then there was another group which decided to talk about right to privacy and this is an entire prezi if i had time i'd show you which was right to privacy and um, then there was another group which did the trial you know who interpreted the freedom of speech on instagram and as you can see it said every court has two sides we present to you three and the judge is no one but the so they made instagram stories of three three stories so the first one was victim photo 2 was actor or agency and photo 3 was public opinion right so this was the ipm undergraduate project and i'll come to the pgp project now for pgp when they talked about mediating identity they used night lab foundation story map which is an again a open source you can just go on and open source being a main cri criteria for most of the platforms i choose most of them i can't predicate all of them most of them again affordances so they talked about dalit community and its identity i can go on and show you the entire thing but i don't think we have time for that uh, there was one group which talked about dalit identity the other group talked about uh, platforms and critique platforms which have enabled different uh, consuming consumer platforms how they have created specific audiences and critiqued it and the last one i'm going to show is uh, pretty standard but talked about me too in the terms of women's rights movements across the globe and they were really invested in this because not a lot of conversation was going on during this point right so i'm going to go back to my powerpoint again anuparna if you could uh, share my powerpoint if that's okay yes so again i just visible? yeah so i just yeah i had just screenshots in case the um, you know digitality and affordances did not allow it okay so this is uh, this is this is the screenshots i'm happy to share that with you okay this is my last slide and this will quickly end by saying where do i locate dh pedagogy in india i locate dh pedagogy in india within coming at a point and these are some of the factors we have governmental institutional funding we have intersectional privileges which aditi so beautifully highlighted and talked about we have technological affordances but all of that should create signifies for dh pedagogy in india which must be humanistic anti hierarchical non exclusionary and collaborative and what what would they help us do they would hopefully help us question that social imaginary of the humanities in the global south where only platforms as i showed in my first slide are created largely for technical or technological epistemes right so and this is all located in a neoliberal economic order and a post covid world and also a social imaginary of the humanities based in colonial signifies where humanities was only for creating babus for imperial overlords right so this is this is the overall structure and this is based within Uh, the glam sector and educational institutions glam is galleries libraries archives museums who and educational institutions which must be very important nodes in creating this conversation nodes in that rhizome okay yeah. i will uh, stop for now and um, you know sorry for pushing time a little bit um, and hope that was all visible and audible yeah okay Thank you, thank you, Dibbo, for kind of you know taking this beautifully sort of from Aditi and and then kind of expanding the field, creating more spaces of inter you know interaction and intersection. Uh, and I think this will flow again very beautifully into what Maya is going to say. So mm, uh, let us quickly move uh, to our next speaker, and we'll take everything together. Uh, I mean, all our questions together in the Q and A session. Uh, so here we have Dr. Maya Lord. and uh, she has received a phd from stanford university in modern thought and literature subsequently she received post doctoral fellowship at princeton university and jnu she also taught in the department of anthropology at princeton university and in english departments at stanford and at the uh, university of florida she has chaired the center for south asia and the at the department of humanities and language at flame university where she teaches literary and cultural studies 
Since 2007, she has been uh, at Flame University and currently she serves as the Assistant Dean for Teaching, Learning and Engagement. Her research interests include digital humanities, South Asian studies and cultural studies, and her teaching is focused on the digital classroom and archiving practices. Over to you. Maya. Thank you so much. Uh, Libya, I'm so happy to follow you because I feel like you've told us about the how and I want to talk about the why, right? And I think the sequence is working really well. So I'm going to try and be very compacted in what I'm doing, but, uh, you know, hopefully I will not overshoot my time. So if I can just begin to share my screen. Um, is this working? It let me try again. Share screen. Yes, my I, I was able to see. For a quick you were able to see. Okay. All good? Uh, not, yeah. Right now, I think the screen's coming up. Yes, correct. All there. Fantastic. Yeah, Fantastic. So, you know, I want to sort of do a little bit of a long run up. Um, in India in 2010, uh, when liberal education, liberal arts colleges were basically non existent, right? The Knowledge Commission uh, was constituted, and in response to that, I wrote this piece, which was called Liberalizing Education. And at that time, essentially, the entire question was posed in terms of numbers, right? This is our sort of most uh, favorite way of talking about education in India. It's always a problem of scale. So essentially, uh, at that time, if you compare in 1947, we had, you know, about 500 colleges. Uh, when I was writing, you know, there were about 30,000. And now the numbers have only, you know, increased, right? So we're looking at this nation of, you know, 1.3 billion, which has 1.4 million schools and around 30,000 colleges, right? Just to give you a sense of the scale, there are about 600 college entrance examinations in this country. And given the emphasis on engineering and medical, right? And this is also about the sort of uh, shift from public to private that's happening under, you know, in real time. Only 4% of medical colleges are, you know, uh, public and 96% of medical seats are provided by private colleges. So obviously now this is proving to be a challenge if you recognize that the cost of a medical education in this country comes to about a crore, right? And Dibya actually pointed very well to the fact that the majority of students undertake uh, a degree in uh, a BA, a Bachelor in Arts, uh, partly because it's affordable uh, in many ways and colleges were meant to certify people for jobs. Uh, but obviously there has been something that uh, is missing, right, in terms of our understanding of whether these people are employable, whether colleges are doing their job adequately and whether there are even enough college seats. And this question of quality, in a sense, gets backgrounded when we look at the numbers, right, at the very beginning. So what I want to sort of draw, uh, you know, something attention to is that in democratic terms, the challenge we often take on is the challenge of scale. And we do try to cater to scale. There's a lot of joy right now with the general, uh, the gross enrollment ratio being projected as a desirable 35 percent by 2025. Uh, just to give you a sense, you know, it was actually 7 percent in 2010. So clearly there has been some growth in terms of number of people joining college and whatnot. And clearly there is still a very substantial number of people who are underserved. And, you know, there are more ways in which this detail can be uh, followed up. But what I'm trying to focus on really is the question of how are we taking on this question of quality, right? And I think the first speaker, right, Aditi, you brought in this idea of the way it used to be in terms of the attention to detail, the focus on a genuine conversation, right? Those sorts of attributes that we believe are the hallmarks of a very good humanities education. And the real question to me is, can you give that right to these sorts of numbers that we're talking about? So if uh, we look at the challenge as not only being one of scale, right, but also being one of um, providing access, right, to the many, uh, the way it sort of often works, and I'm pointing us to a particular program, it's a Mensa, uh, what do you call it, talent spotting hunt, which goes on. Uh, it's conducted by an organization called Dhruv, and there are other sort of players also. But essentially, like, for instance, this is tribal Mensa nurturing program. The approximate number of Mensa level students that they identify in most of these sample sizes is about 10%, which is phenomenal. Uh, it is incredible right there are, i mean programs like this of course should exist but the idea is basically the numbers game again right you find the worthy candidate and then you try to sort of hone or groom or whatever supply them with some resource so the simple question remains that is quality education for the few or for the many right and clearly what we've seen in the past 10 years also in addition to rising gers is the rise of mass learning right we have MOOCs which have 
started as free around the world. Uh, in the Indian case, we have Swayam, which is a government-based uh, platform. But uh, did we lose Maya for a uh, Maya? I think you're frozen. Yeah. Maya, you're frozen. Can you? Um, are we audible? I suppose this is what kept happening when I was talking. So yeah, exactly. I get to see it from the other side. <laughs> Maybe my yeah. uh, sorry. I think she might be yeah, rejoining. Think, we'll give her a couple of minutes. Yeah. So just wondering. So we are live on the Shangla uh, Shangla right, YouTube right. channel, correct? Right. Yes. No, it's been interesting, right? Uh, as we as we talk about uh, affordances, as Aditi and Onfas are presenting, there's so many new. So Streamyard, I checked last evening, is just about a year old, right? It's Ooh. just about a year yeah. old. Yeah, so I'm sure yeah. a lot of companies are actually making a lot of money in this situation. Uh, right, know. I'm so sure. So what are, are the platforms that you use <laughs> in your uh, you mean classroom teaching? That's a good question, right? That's that's I think a very important question. I think something that will come to later as well. So we are right now using Zoom exclusively, right? So Zoom is our platform for teaching. I know um, others are uh, using Google Meet. Yeah, um, we have shifted to Google Meet. We have shifted. To, I mean, we use Google Meet. Right. Right. So, mm -hmm. I, I also realized while with the political situation could be, but uh, I also realized yeah. while saying out these platforms, we are also endorsing them in some way. No, we are so, not. Uh, endorsing right. Yeah. So that's, that's something I want to make very clear. Right. We're not not an endorsement of any platform of Zoom, Google Meet, Streamyard. We are doing uh, things because um, yeah, affordances again. It's the key question. But we also take yeah. And I, I mean, in the lack of being able to develop our own, but we could shift to open source. True. You know, we have the See, there open source video Trying conferencing open. software. There is Jitsi allows you open source to some extent. Yeah. But Aditi, I think this is a question that I would have probably, you know, on an offline or an online conversation, we could have. And it's also about what is accessible to the students with their devices, right? It seems Zoom, yeah. So it's Zoom has a particular, uh, it is able to function on a slightly lower bandwidth than as opposed to Google Meet in some cases, which seems to be one of the main reasons. Um, yeah, so um, Zoom, I mean, in my experience of the three that I've tried, I've tried Zoom, I've tried Google Meet and I've tried Microsoft Microsoft Teams. Teams. Right. I liked I liked Zoom the best, uh, frankly, but there were some security issues. And mm. um, I think our institution also bought G Suite, uh, you know, what do right. they call it? G Suite, right? So G Suite, we, right. Yeah, so now we have officially we subscribe to Google Classroom, so we are Just doing our classes. On, uh, for a second, yeah. uh, I cannot see Maya though. But then is she presenting? She's not in the meeting, as far as I can tell. She's not the in the meeting. I think. Yeah, she's not in the meeting. Drop her you try giving her call. a yeah. You could try giving her a call. A call and ask her. We're That's... having a nice chat in the meantime, anyway. Right, and um, so I, Brag, I was just curious. So mm. when you are doing a G suit, is it you bought that G suit for your institution? Has yeah, bought yeah. G suit. So the institution has bought G suit, and we now have domain IDs. Uh, right. So are we, yeah, and we are also we we are recording the, the the lectures get recorded and stored on the cloud basically, which we have right. which we bought. So there are some. I mean, so the difference that I find is I think Zoom the video quality is quite good, and another nice mm. thing is that you can see all of the screens. Uh, you know, you can have up to 30, 40 uh, screens on one screen at the same time. With Google Meet, one of the things I can't figure out is on what basis I, you, you only see about, I think, 20 or like 12 or 15 screens. And I'm right. not sure. Uh, you have a set. Oh, you know about actually, that? I think. 
Yeah, yeah. You did you have some kind of a setting to tell it to oh, no, no. fix itself? I, I know there's like there's a tile mode yeah. and there's other modes, but even on the tile mode, you can't see the entire class at the same time, and nor can you scroll through. So there are some people who are appearing on the screen mysteriously. I don't know why, and there are other people who just don't appear at all. If you speak, then you appear, but if you don't speak, then you're not there. So I'm, I don't know what their algorithm yep. is. It's worth looking into because again, you know, we are talking about divides and privileges. And I think one thing, Aditi, that you mentioned, uh, and Deepo also mentioned to some extent, is like what happens is that the more confident ones or the ones who speak are always there in the class, and you know, uh, and the others are sort of just invisible. And again, with this Google Meet situation, I don't know why some people uh, are there. And sorry some for interrupting. For a second, uh, so uh, we're trying to contact the speaker. So uh, right. please kind of hold on, or else we can move to the last speaker, uh, sure, Prag. Can... But then yeah, we'll just wait for Should two minutes. Yeah, 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 sure. Two minutes. Let's wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah. So they were then... Yep. Uh, yeah. So let's wait for a couple of. Could, could could you get in touch with Maya because I'm trying to get in touch with her. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I just try. Then I'll just. Uh, Stop yeah. cam and try to call her offline. Sure, That's sure. Okay. Because, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just to continue with what Prayag was saying, so that people watching don't get bored and we have, you know, some other things to talk about. Uh, no, not just that. No, but but yeah, that is, I mean, even in a normal, you know, classroom, it's difficult if it's a huge classroom to get everybody to speak and to engage. Yeah. But at least, you know, you have this option of eye contact and then, you know, not you know, things. I'll talk about that actually, because, my, you know, one thing I've realized is that certain things just don't translate onto the online experience, such as micro expressions. All right. One thing that what I've noticed is that, for instance, if something is going over someone's head, right, in the class, you're talking and, you know, you may be going at a certain level and suddenly you think, all right, is this are people following? And then you can look around and see. And, you know, this expression of befuddled or, you know, I'm not exactly following it. That's not a very obvious expression. It's very, very subtle. It's a kind of very, OK, you know, maybe a slight narrowing of the eyes or something like that. And you can't really catch that on, on Google Meet. So, you know, it's very hard to are off, then you really cannot because, you know, that's another thing exactly. that we have to do on Google Meet last semester because of the bandwidth. And and just to include everybody, 77 students somewhere on really, really terrible networks is that right. everybody had their video and audio off. Even I had my video off, actually. So it was audio only. And then I was presenting. So the presentation they could see. But otherwise, mm. there were no audios or videos. So it was just a... Um, audio classroom, like kind of radio classroom in I some way. That's very challenging. I mean, one of the things, again, I'll talk about, I'm just going to give a couple of tips on video lectures from my own experience. And one thing I've realized is that for me, at least, uh, you know, when the students have their video on, that's far better than when they don't yeah, have the it good on. News, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I was able to get to Maya. Maya had actually moved on with her presentation. <laughs> so she'll be back. She's trying to get back. So that should be good. Yeah, sorry. And I think Maya is uh, back. Sorry, I didn't realize I was yeah. not talking because this is what happens when you're talking to nobody. You're know, <laughs> just okay. talking about that. Yes. So, okay. So, I don't know if I was about here, Divya, when I was. I think uh, Anuparna needs to share your PowerPoint again. Yes. Oh, I, I will. Oh, so, I'm okay. waiting for that. Yes. Um, was this where I was at? Uh, yeah. I do have. Yes. 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 Okay, so I will speed through this again, uh, which was basically the question of quality, the question of access, right? And the real question of what is quality for? Is it for the few or for the many? Uh, I also mentioned, of course, the rise of MOOCs, where the access to quality education presumably has happened at a global level. And so the question becomes, if we can basically get online and access all of this, what is it that we require from classrooms or from higher education, right? And the answer really uh, is sort of self-evident in a sense that if everybody has access, then why do we have a Baiju's, right? We have a Khan Academy, which gives you even in the Indian context, right, math lessons from K through 12. But the need for Baiju's indicates to you the need for a certain mentoring and the need for facilitation, right? And to me, the question that this uh, begets is the how do we enable or, uh, you know, sort of uh, allow for facilitation at the college level? And uh, this is coming through also not just to push, you know, from, I think, 21st century updating, but also from the UGC saying that, you know, digital uh, blooms taxonomy should be applied to all levels. And this is about returning an attention back to the learner. Right. So the simple question that 
you know, every course should be asking, right, is what do you want your students to learn at the end of each lesson? Uh, do you think they understand? How do they demonstrate that they have learned? And at what level is this learning acceptable? So now how do we actually get back to making our students, right, get a chance at demonstrating their learning? And this is different from the access question, which is the idea that you are just about receiving materials, right, which you often are on a MOOC. But really, this is about giving people the chance to apply them. Now, Dibya mentioned that he uses essentially open source tools. And there are many, many such tools. I do the same uh, in terms of my students and their uh, you know, work. They, it's all been created really on sort of timelines and using wakes and such in the way that Dibya mentioned. Uh, the work that they do, though, interestingly, often feeds into, feeds into real world need. So whether it's about, like, for instance, this one, where they, uh, you know, liaison with the Office of the Botanical Survey of India, Western uh, region, this is in Pune, and they sort of put together chronologically different botanical surveys that have been done and that actually build on each other, but which had never been chronologically arranged. The botanical survey uh, itself was very surprised, you know, that students are interested in doing this work. And the point is, this is co what constitutes service-based learning, right? Now, service learning actually affords the reason for a project, which then also uh, lets students evidence their own uh, ability. So the possibilities that both project-based learning and, in a sense, DH pedagogy afford are the ability to participate in a public space, uh, the fact that the portfolio can exist, right, in terms of uh, demonstration of ability, and the fact that it can actually be based on an end use. So given sort of the way in which these things can be structured, I'd be really glad to talk about more of this uh, in the q and I know we're running late. Um, and also the fact that this is not only related to humanities work alone. People are doing it in math, in economics, uh, through GIS. This work also exists. And at Dharti, we have many such conversations. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can talk more about, you know, public utility and design for a much wider cause, you know, by many people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Maya. So since we've lost some time, so we'll directly move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Prayag Ray, and we'll again take the questions once we are done. Uh, so our final speaker for the panel is uh, Dr. Prayag Ray, uh, who is an assistant professor of English at St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. He completed his uh, BA and NA from Jadavpur University, his MPhil from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and his PhD from Queen's University, Belfast, in 2018. His MPhil research was on Indian speculative fiction, while his PhD research was on British and Irish representations of Hinduism in the 18th century. His research interests include fantasy fiction, popular culture, and post-colonial literature. He has published critical and creative work with Springer, Routledge, and uh, Poetry Island. Before teaching at St. Xavier's University, he has led tutorials at Queen's University and taught a tool course at JNU. Over to you, uh, Prayag. Uh, sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, can I just check that I'm uh, uh, audible yes, yes. and visible? Oh. Yeah. I have a fan on right next to me. I hope that's not oh, too audible not? because okay, okay, that's great. So okay, thank you. Firstly, can I just thank uh, the folks at Chongla, uh, Orkoda, uh, uh, you know, and Shorita and Onuponadi as well uh, for inviting me uh, here to speak. Thank you for giving me this, this opportunity, uh, and thank you also to the other speakers we've had a very interesting set of conversations and I've learned a lot um, but I'll just say right uh, at the beginning that you know uh, today I'm going to be talking at a very kind of practical level um, you know I'm not particularly conversant in the language of digital humanities I'm sort of more of an old school literature professor but I have you know I integrate uh, digital media and you know technology into my teaching so uh, forgive me if I'm not sort of conversant in the terminology of uh, digital humanities um, but um, so I'm not going to be talking at a kind of very theoretical level um, or even getting very political per se. I will be really giving some practical tips, I think, uh, you know, and sharing my experiences of online teaching, really, and uh, trying to say, you know, you know, talk about what can we do with this, given the situation that we're in, uh, what can we do with it? Um, but to begin with, I think I'll just acknowledge um, briefly uh, the obvious issue of, of privilege. And this digital divide. I think it's been discussed 
uh, in earlier panels, so I won't spend much time on it. But obviously, uh, in a country, a developing country like ours, uh, we have to acknowledge that online teaching is not for everyone. And, and that is a major, major problem. Personally, at St. Xavier's University, um, I'm lucky in that uh, I'm fairly certain all of our students have access to at least a smartphone or a laptop. So uh, we don't have a situation where some people are not being able to access uh, our lectures. But we do have you know, gradations. We have some people with better internet, some people with worse. But yes, of course, we, we must acknowledge that this is a situation that can put potentially uh, exacerbate uh, already existing uh, divides. Um, you know, I was having a conversation early on in the lockdown with my colleagues. Uh, and one of my colleagues was of the view that even if one student in the class, and I hope he's listening here, uh, uh, he may be watching this on YouTube. He said that even if there's one student in the class who does not have access to your video lectures, then it would be better to not have, you know, to just pause for a year, pause education, because it's just completely unfair. Um, you know, because in a physical classroom, even if you're coming from somewhere far away, at least you're there in the class. Now, if there's a situation where two or three students simply cannot access the lectures, that's obviously a, a terrible situation. And you know, I while I agree with that, and I can't question the sort of moral probity of that statement, um, I told my colleague that look, I mean, to to some extent, we kind of have to be practical and accept that you know, education is not going to grind to a halt uh, for one year. Um, you know, if it did as well, that would create problems. You know, the job market is not going to stop. Uh, students still need their degrees. So if education ground to a halt for a year, that, you know, that's a problem. Again, some of my students have said that having online classes is helping them structure their lives, get some mental health. So I think it benefits them. So essentially, I, I completely acknowledge that this is in some ways an unfair situation. But at the same time, I've made my peace with having to go ahead with it. So what I'm here to talk about today is how can we make this a workable situation? OK, but to begin with, I have to, I have to just talk about how you know, it's not ideal. So online lectures as a kind of poor substitute for physical classes. And this is particularly for me. I feel that you know, my, my pedagogy, uh, the way I do things, uh, you know, I really like yeah, that. If I, might, if I can interrupt you once your voice yeah. is cracking for some reason. OK. So um, let me just check your microphone. Uh, fine I, now, but then I yeah. Yeah, yeah, your uh, voice was fine till the point you started speaking. So I yeah. think that might be something. Yeah. Uh, should I do something? Should I stop my camera? No, now you're great again. Now, now you're again fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but do tell me if there's issues. Yeah. So I was just saying that you know the physical classroom. I of course I prefer it. I walk about a lot. You know that I, it helps me think. Um, and I can also make sure that people are paying attention. Again, on the online classroom i don't know if someone is sort of just drifting off uh, you know when i walk around it keeps them attentive as well um again little things micro expressions i was uh, i was talking about that earlier with aditi that when they're not following i can tell in a physical classroom because it's a very subtle expression that you know i'm, I'm not following which you can't catch on an online so, uh, uh, yeah, space again your voice yeah. is breaking so i don't know how it's translating over youtube Should so I... you know so, yes, I think is it it's an issue with your headphone or the microphone? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Well, I have another. I have another headphone. Should I try fine? that? I can yeah, do that. Fine. Fine. You're Should fine. You're fine. Right, 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 right now, it's fine. The I problem. Is fine. That's very strange. So, yeah. when other people, maybe you shouldn't mute your, mute yourselves. Keep yourselves uh, un <laughs> unmuted. I don't know if, if that's what we're observing. Let's be scientific <laughs> about this. At least a few of you keep yourselves uh, on unmute, all right? So let's see if yeah, that's fine. As long as the methodology yeah. holds true, as other people said. Yeah. Right? Let's see. Let's see. Let's try this, OK? Yeah. So anyway, I was talking about the obvious benefits of a, of a physical classroom. There's a sense of uh, conviviality and camaraderie amongst the students because they're physically present as well. You know, someone tells, you know, I tell a joke, someone reacts a particular way, another person sort of, uh, you know, reacts to that. So obviously, that kind of thing can't happen. So anyway, let's move on from this, because obviously, you know, we all acknowledge that this is not an ideal situation. But uh, I'll, uh, another thing I'll do is before going on to talking about my experiences of online lectures, I'll actually talk about technology use in offline classrooms in physical classrooms, uh, because this is something I do a lot. Uh, am I audible, by the way, is the problem a little yes. bit better? Great. So I am privileged to have at St. Xavier's because it is, you know, it does cater to 
perhaps some of the more privileged students and you know uh, we 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 do have good infrastructure so i'm privileged to have in the classroom caller mics uh, podium mic uh, a projector as well as a computer with wi-fi and i will admit that i use media quite heavily uh, the projector and the computer and and various other things and to begin with i'd like to say why you know why do i do this um, and I'll, I'll have to explain this on two grounds. Firstly, my own sort of philosophy of teaching, you might say, my beliefs about what education should do. And secondly, uh, you know, the what you might call the epistemic conditions that we're in, which are very changed, you know, even 20 years ago when I, but not 20 years ago, uh, even 10, 12 years ago when I was, was in college, things were a little bit different. So to begin with, you know, my philosophy of teaching, why, why do I, you know, need to use media? I think number one, that a teacher's role is not to provide information, but to stimulate, uh, to create interest. I think most people here would be, uh, you know, in agreement with me uh, that you know I'm not there to give you the information. In our day and age, the information is all there. All right, anyone can just go to LibGen and download books, and you know, my job is to curate. My job is to create interest and to stimulate. In doing so, help. All right. Uh, secondly, I think teaching is more about being an effective communicator than it is about content. Again, this may be a controversial point, uh, but I think teaching is about 60% performance and 40% content, or maybe even 70, 30. It's, it's really a kind of theater. It's a kind of drama. And, you know, I've had plenty of situations where, you know, someone may be a, a you know, world leading expert in a particular topic, but maybe they're not such an effective communicator. Whereas you may benefit more from a teacher who, you know, not necessarily is, you know, a world leader on a particular topic, but is more effective in creating interest and communicating that. So that and finally, I, I believe in the importance of contemporaneity, uh, contemporaneity. All right. So, you know, I need to be relevant. I need to be in touch. Uh, I have a kind of down with the kids approach where I'm constantly trying to, okay, what are the kids doing? What are they, you know, what are they, again, I don't want to be uh, kind of, I don't want to call them kids. I'm hardly about eight years older than some of my MA students. But the point is that, you know, I have this down with the kids approach. So this is why I, I use so much media um, from my end, all right? Uh, but also let's talk about the epistemic conditions. Um, I think, again, most people will agree when I say that there are shorter attention spans these days, you know? Amongst our students, attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. I don't want to pathologize it and call it, uh, you know, ADD, attention deficit disorder, but it is, you know, it's comparable. Uh, simply attention spans are getting shorter. and. Uh, so are ours, I think. All right. So instead of that kind of 50 minutes of just talking to someone, you do need to break the monotony of that uh, continuous lecture. And sometimes media does help, you know, stimulating the students, breaking that monotony of the continuous lecture. Secondly, I think we have to talk about the ubiquity of the image and sound in young people's lives. All right. There, you know, the cultural imaginary is saturated with images in a way that it wasn't even 20 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, I, I often begin teaching a topic by exploring paintings and music. Uh, so, for instance, when I start, was teaching Romanticism, we were looking at romantic paintings, listening to a bit of Beethoven, because I realized that, you know, we will read the novels, we will read, the uh, you know, the poems, the plays. But uh, let's let's begin by getting a kind of immediate sort of, I have a kind of um, feel-oriented, affect-based pedagogy. I believe that you have to experience the text and feel it and that's why i often begin with you know image and music and then uh get into the text so i sometimes use live music in pedagogy um you know I'm, i play the guitar i sing a little bit so where it's relevant you know i do so i've for instance while teaching joyce uh, there's a short story called the dead which we all know um uh there's a very important the turning point of that story is a song called the lass of ogrim so I, I usually play that and, you know, I get a student. So I have a violinist in my uh, PG2 classroom, Debrani. Uh, she, you know, she performed it with me. And I think these things, you know, while they may seem a little gimmicky, I think, I, you know, I think there's nothing wrong in being entertaining while also educating. All right. Um, so that a um, couple of more points again on why so much media use and why I think it's important. Uh, I think in my discipline, adaptations and afterlives are just as important as the text itself talking about this the the has the heyday of the fat old tome gone all right that big the book the print you know how has the digital um, you know leap uh, influenced that the the status of that printed book and you know in in literature we insist on of course reading the novel and i i will always go through kind of diabolical steps to make sure that they've read the novel such as uh, having an objective <laughs> objective type test on the novel uh, 
Uh, yeah, it doesn't test anything, but it makes sure they've read it. Uh, so yes, we insist on the, 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 the printed book. You read that. But we are also invested in our afterlives and adaptations. I mean, if you look at, say, Frankenstein, which is a very obvious example where the afterlife of the text is almost like uh, the monster. You know, it's almost in an antagonistic relationship with the original text. So anyway, my point is that, you know, the afterlife of the text is also how students these days often encounter a text. So, I mean, while when I'm teaching Homer, yes, I'll say read, you know, read the Iliad, but also watch Troy. I mean, they've seen Brad Pitt, uh, you know, in Troy. So you can't leave these things out. All right. So that's enough about why I use a lot of media. So let me now tell you about how I use uh, technology and media in uh, in teaching uh, PowerPoints. Uh, controversial. A lot of people don't like PowerPoints. And I can, I, you know, I, I know that it can be distracting. So let me just share my screen here, ironically, perhaps, and show you a PowerPoint. Uh, it's getting kind of meta, PowerPoint about PowerPoints. But uh, can you see this? Onupanadi, if you can just um, uh, let me know, folks, if I'm, if you can see my screen. Yeah, yes. OK, so tips about PowerPoints. Now, I really think there's one thing that nobody does, at least I, nobody I know of. But you know, you can make these points appear one at a time because otherwise, there's a, you know, you're inundated with information. You put on a slide, and there's so much information, and there's someone talking over it. So you don't know who to pay attention to. Do you listen to the the professor, or do you read the information on the screen? So it can get very distracting. So what I do is I make the points appear one at a time. So let me show you how to do that. You select all of them. You go to animations. You click appear okay and then you go to the animation pane over here and then you can number them all right i'm sorry if i'm being kind of uh, patronizing many of you might already know how to do this but uh just for other people even my students who are watching you know in your presentations you can do this so now when i've done this and i go to slideshow and i go to current slide this is what's going to show up and when i press space they'll appear one point at a time so i'll make one point up here i'll talk on it Again, not too much information, all right? If there's way too much information, they, they'll be just distracted trying to read that while also listening to me. So what I'll do is I'll have a short amount of information, a small amount of information, and then I'll sort of talk over that. About the point, and then I'll discuss it. And this helps to avoid a clash between what you're saying and what people are forced to read. And finally, of course, you can weave in images and, and if relevant, music. So. Um, so that's PPTs. Then, of course, you have other things like video clips. Uh, many times we're teaching plays. So when I'm teaching Hamlet, for instance, there are some excellent adaptations. It's a, you know, they often miss out on the performed aspect of these texts. So it's very useful to show them short video clips. Uh, I also use, again, perhaps controversially, but memes and jokes. I noticed that Debo had a meme, so I was feeling a little bit, you know, had that Boromir. Uh, so I, I sometimes I, I judge myself. Am I being, you know, trivial? Am I not professorial enough uh, because sometimes I make very lame jokes. My PGs will remember red Shelley, dead Shelley. Uh, it's, it's just never mind. I'm not getting into that. But the point is, again, I think it's important to stay relevant and in touch with young people. Okay, so I use memes sometimes. Uh, um, all right, then screenings. Often it's useful to show a film adaptation. Another thing that I use, again, this is quite comic. Uh, my my colleagues Onuponadi will remember this, but. Uh, when I have a cough, uh, you know, back, back in the day when having a cough didn't necessarily imply you're going to be dead in two days. Uh, back when I used to have a normal cough, I sometimes what I do is you can't lecture, right? But I have to take my classes. So there's a there's an app called Voice Allowed Reader, which basically reads out PDFs aloud. So I'll turn my notes into a, a PDF and I'll get the robot to read it out. And this can be surprisingly entertaining, you know. I, uh, so for instance, I'll throw in a little joke, like in the middle of the lecture, I'll uh, you know, in the middle of the notes, I'll put in a little line saying, you at the back, keep quiet. So it's quite entertaining when you have a, a robot telling you to keep quiet. So yeah, things like this. Um, again, perhaps even more strangely, I use social media sometimes, not necessarily to uh, teach in the classroom, but you know, I'm constantly thinking about text and I'm posting about text in my social media. So I'll give you one little example. And, and some of my students do follow me on Instagram. So they did, in fact, say that this is like an uh, you know, uh, an additional thing to your lecture. And so I'll give you, I'll show you an example um, quickly. I was teaching Aristotle's poetics, right? And I was thinking about the distinction that Aristotle makes between uh, poetry and history. 
and on my way back home uh, i was going in the car right and can you see this can can people see this not yet okay yeah now yes all right so i noticed on the window uh, of the car okay it was raining and i noticed that you know there are these patterns forming and that when the raindrop when, when the car moves the raindrop gets sort of smeared into a kind of line and i noticed that you know this is similar to the distinction that aristotle makes between history and poetry and so i posted that on my instagram history you know the historian will record everything that happens so that's everything that you see on the on the window okay but poetry unlike history is you know it has to be uh, you know causality there has to be co a causal link so that's like the single line of rain that gets sort of stretched out into a line the little dots forming a line anyway so the point is that i'll often post things on instagram and my students do appreciate that um then uh, i once used uh, twitter in a class uh, i said uh, you know i was teaching english communication and i said all right uh, we're doing the short story called uh, the last leaf so why don't you try to summarize the story of the last leaf into a tweet so they enjoyed that i think um and even facebook i once had to take an extra class uh, you know a substitution class for a colleague and you know i didn't have any material so i was like you know either i can completely waste this time and just do adda or we can do something fun so i uh, i opened up my instagram and i said okay i'm going to analyze my profile picture and try to kind of locate it within my culture and my background and my history and and you know i said can any of you want to do you want to step up and self analyze so we did that so you know just little fun things like that so that's the you know that's about the physical classroom so i'm done with this issue so as i said i i use a lot of media in my classroom and i think it's i think it's fun i think my students you know maybe they can say uh, tell me if it's fun or not in the questions but so that all right and now let's get to the second half of my talk where i'm going to be talking about online lectures now uh, my experience of online lecturing actually began before the lockdown because i got chicken pox uh, in january i got a very severe case of chicken pox and being the kind of uh, you know i i am a bit of a workaholic and i didn't want to miss any classes so even through my chicken pox i was taking online lectures where i didn't know about zoom and and the likes then so what i did was take uh, youtube live classes and that was all right it was challenging because i was talking to a blank screen there were no students so it wasn't a great deal of fun but i realized even then that you know you can be innovative and you can be interesting and you can use the space that you're in so you know i was teaching structuralism and i was talking about how human beings are inevitably look for structure everywhere okay and i noticed that my ceiling fan has what appears to be a face on it uh, it's just a patch of rust but it it looks like a human face so i began one class without giving any explanation the first two or three minutes the you know my my phone which i was using then was just focused on that face on my fan and they were intrigued i think i hope and you know then i began discussing the relevance of that to socio and structuralism but the point is you can use the space i mean i often pull out books from here and there this is something that's useful about teaching from home i have my entire library with me i can just pull out books so use this okay let's not be you know some of my friends and other teachers are very uh, kind of um, Uh, you know pessimistic about online teaching and i agree it's not as good as physical teaching but let's make the most of the situation we're in all right it's not the end well it maybe it is the end of the world but let's let's go down having a bit of fun okay so that's how my online teaching began then we began teaching in a formal way uh, using mostly uh, video lectures but several other uh, modalities were uh, tried out uh, by my colleagues voice notes uh, recorded video lectures um uh, email materials um text based classes on google classroom and then eventually we've settled on uh, google meet and google classroom so i'll just talk about these very briefly i'll wrap up in about 5 5 to 7 minutes but let's talk about google classroom first of all which i really really enjoy um it's sort of like facebook meets uh, teaching you know it's very enabling in many ways you can share little links to things you can leave ppts there you can leave readings there you can post links to youtube uh, videos you can do various interesting things you know uh, uh, during the lockdown i ran something which i was calling a summer reading camp where it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, compulsory but i was reading or putting up a reading on google classroom every day so on a weekly basis i would post seven readings they would be maximum 20 to 25 pages long it would take only about an hour to an hour and a half to read and they were keeping a, i asked the students to keep a reading journal 
all right, which is basically a kind of summary and critical appreciation of the piece that you've read. And to post that on a daily basis on Google Classroom. And I think many of them really appreciated this. It kept them in the academic mode. It encouraged them to write. Um, it improved their, uh, their, you know, their uh, style. So all of this wouldn't have happened had we not been in this situation, all right? So let's look at the ways in which it can be enabling. All right, Google Classroom, I can have conversations in writing with them. Writing is very important for English students. It encourages them to write. Assignments can be taken more regularly. So the CIA uh, continuous internal assessment is really for the first time actually continuous. We're trying to give short little assignments on every Saturday to our students without making it too stressful. Okay, and you can also have fun assignments, uh, interesting assignments. So during my summer reading camp, I, I put up a Rorschach ink blot test and I said, why don't you just react to this creatively or critically? What do you make of this image that appears? So you can do interesting things like that, all right? And finally, there's another aspect to Google Classroom, which is very interesting, which is unique, which wouldn't have happened in a physical classroom, which is you can interact with other teachers, you know? So my colleague Antaradi posted, uh, you know, uh, an assignment and I was like, can I write a response to this? This is very interesting uh, because I, I liked this particular piece that she was talking about. So we had a kind of chat there. And so, you know, professors interacting and this must be an interesting dynamic for students as well to observe. Okay. Well, what are our professors doing? They're chatting with each other on, on uh, Google Classroom. Okay, so that's Google Classroom. Let's talk briefly about video lectures. And I'll keep this very brief. Uh, you know what? One thing I did, I'll start with the cons. Again, most people know the problems, what they are. But I actually did a kind of survey. I asked some of my students, the class representatives. So I'm very uh, thankful to them. But what are the issues with online teaching, with this live video lecture? So to, to mention some of the cons first, obviously technological barriers, okay? So low connectivity, crashing of gadgets, phone or laptop overheating. And again, I understand this is a deeply political issue. You know, it's, it's about privilege, it's about access. You know, whoever has better technology will be, you know, will be uh, more enabled. And I understand that's a problem, okay? What else? Online courses make it easier to procrastinate. You can just switch off your video and go, you know, go go off somewhere, fall asleep. Um, it's difficult for people with migraine issues, which is a major concern. Uh, it can be stressful on the eye. It's difficult for people with eye problems, you know, staring at a screen the whole day. The home environment might not be conducive to letting students concentrate. It's on a you know, someone walking in and walking out, etc. I feel conscious sometimes. Look at the maa I mean, I, you know, I see all kinds of random things in my class sometimes. Whatever comes into my mind, you know, I'm not always in professorial mode. And now I'm like, OK, <laughs> their parents are judging me. So I have to be careful. OK, um, all right. Convenient for bunking. Uh, you can blame it on the network. You can switch off your video. You can go to sleep, etc. So these are some of the cons. Interestingly, some of the students said there are some pros, uh, one of which is that it has given them some sense of routine. I think the main problem with this pandemic situation is that people's lives are falling apart. You don't have any compulsion to wake up at a decent hour. So, you know, there was a phase where I was waking up at two o'clock in the afternoon, going to sleep at 7 a.m. in the morning. OK, so it has created some sense of routine for them. Uh, you know, it's helped them organize their meals, their sleep. Secondly, uh, it's better than waiting around for when offline classes can be held safely. So, so many of our students think that it's better that there is some education rather than no education. It's better than offline classes in the middle of a pandemic as well. Money, at least they're not having to go and sort of risk their lives to, in attending offline classes. And finally, it's convenient in the sense that it saves traveling. Uh, and you know, often that long commute I teach in Rajarhat. So St. Xavier's University's campus is in Rajarhat. So it's a, it's a far away place. OK, so that's what the student said. Now, I'm just going to give a couple of tips. I'm going to talk about video lectures, all right? In just a couple of minutes, and then I'll wrap up, which is that, OK, challenges for me, number one, obviously, it's not the same. I've already talked about this, You know how it's not like the physical classroom. But what can we do to mitigate this? What can we do to uh, make the situation better? Number one, keeping video on. For me, it's really, really useful. Even here in this chat, I'm looking at your expressions and looking at your reactions. Because teaching is it has to be participatory, all right? Otherwise, you're talking to a wall. So again, I know there are issues here with some students. They've said keeping their video on means the sound quality deteriorates and they can't follow. So, so some people are better able to do this. But nonetheless, if at least half of the class has their video on some of the time, it's useful for me. It really, really helps. Secondly, I would say, and this is very, very important, I feel, we can't just 
you know, lecture top down for, for 50 minutes. We can't just talk continuously. It's just boring. They're not, it's not a physical classroom. They're going to zone out. They're not going to pay attention. So I insist on sort of breaking up my lecture. Every five or seven minutes, I'll, I'll you know, I'll make a joke. I'll say something. I'll ask people if they're following or, you know, just break up the monotony of that. Okay. And make it more participatory. Sometimes it's useful to have individual chats. Maybe before the class begins, you could talk to a student, ask them if they're having issues. Again, in the current situation, it's about morale. All right, everyone's going through this crisis. Some people have lost family members, uh, you know, or have fallen sick themselves. So I spend the first few minutes just catching up, finding out what's going on, and you know, pastoral care, just sort of giving them some sense that we'll get through this and that we're all together, a sense of community. Okay. It's useful to have individual chats sometimes with students. If they ask questions, that's really, really nice. I often let these questions go on, you know, the, the question and answer go on for a while, even if it's distracting, because it gets people to pay attention. All right. You're, you're interested in listening to a conversation much more than you are in listening to someone just yammering for, for one hour, OK, yapping for one hour. Uh, so, uh, finally, uh, you know, really, really important, again, I feel, is to change this, you know, to make it basically very participatory. And what have what I've been doing is I've been insisting on student presentations. This is something that I accidentally learned. I'm at a PhD class here. In our PhD classes, we encourage presentations. Obviously, they're trying to develop the confidence to become professors themselves. So we insist on them presenting a lot, right? So in one PhD class, it was mainly them talking, all right? And that day, it was a wonderfully successful class. We all enjoyed ourselves a lot. And that's when I realized that, hey, for online lectures, this works much better than just me talking. So now what I've done is that I'm using it in my MA classes. I just did Renaissance background. I gave them a PPT, which I had made, where I subdivided the whole background issue into set, you know, different topics. I was like uh, Renaissance print culture, uh, you know, competing models of princely virtue. So I divided it up into subtopics and I said, OK, you can use my PPT, but do a bit of research yourself and then present. So 10 minute presentations in groups, two people, one group and talk on a particular topic. And that was really successful. Again, many students, you know, it, it, it gives them the agency. All right. The onus of learning is given to them and they are so much more interested when they, you know, when they're doing that learning, when they're taking that agency. So we had a really interesting class and I think I will, you know, I will continue with this mode, maybe 50, 50 or 60, 40, where many classes, more classes I'll talk in, but certainly there'll be presentations okay so that's me done um that's pretty much me done i was just here to talk about how can we you know if we are to take online lectures as a mode that we have to accept how can we make this more fun how can we make this beneficial so yeah that's me thank you very much so uh, thank you Priya, uh, for bringing in the practical aspects actually in, in fact we were also thinking through while you were speaking and we have all faced similar situations uh, uh, I don't know, like when uh, we have often asked our students, I mean, their preferred mode and many felt that, you know, pre-recorded mode would be a good way of sort of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, taking, uh, we have all adopted mixed modes of teaching, but uh, many students have actually suggested, and I think Adhvi would kind of, you know, attest to that, that they have kind of gone for the pre-recorded mode. But to my experience, you know, uh, these uh, digital um, uh, sort of, yes, uh, the boy, I, I'll just hand it over to you. Uh, but then uh, my experience is, you know, these digital recordings are like digital record, you know, Xerox, where you actually photocopy and you keep them in some nice folder and it just stays uh, there for ages. Uh, so I, I don't know, what's your experience? I mean, what are the modes that work best, you know, particularly when we have such an intense volume of, you know, teaching? If I could just jump in one quick point, uh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, yes. I actually love yes. what Proag did right now, right? Sort of also his code switching was interesting, right? Proag was code switching. Uh, and But I think it's very important to understand what we understand to be digital pedagogy right now. And I was harping about the various signifiers. Like, like knowledge systems are based in print based paradigms. We can't use a digital pedagogy paradigm that uses the classroom, the physical classroom as normative. Like that's the problem with online digital pedagogy right now. So mm -hmm. we have to have a combination of synchronous and asynchronous, which is when Prayak came to Google Classroom. I completely agree with him. I, I thought Google Classroom was a fantastic way of getting that conversation far because you know silence is also a marker of participation, which in an offline class, I see an engaged student nodding. And I know that person is far more invested 
than the person sitting at the back or who's just sort of on his mobile right so, i don't know sometimes they nod even when they're not some people are just nodders all right <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand some people at the back are paying in you know intense Fair enough. So, my my major point was the idea of not making the physical classroom as the normative for creating the digital classroom because digital is a far different paradigm altogether so that has to be acknowledged and synchronous and asynchronous must be brought in together so that was just sorry quick point yeah. in fact i just wanted to add to that same thing if i may anuparna um so because prayag's talk was like great because also um it, it seems that we follow very simple very similar sort of you know pedagogies when it comes to like the physical classroom in which you know i would include sort of you know videos and music uh, I, i i would always sort of screen little things i'd try and get them online i'd try get uh, i i even had one class in which we listened to a podcast discussion between four people who were discussing the topic we were discussing in class and then we joined the discussion even though you know they couldn't answer us the problem i found with the digital sort of classroom was pretty much what they were pointed out is that um you know with this problem of exactly what i would call inequality in which you know there are some students who are not able to attend you know there there's a there's bandwidth problems there's so many problems that i have just you know gone back to you know the really bare basics of teaching when it comes mm. to teaching you know i've i've started pre recording lectures which i hated you know why why would i want to lecture for 50 minutes you know i i would rather talk for 5 minutes and then crack a joke and then get another person involved and now it is it has pushed me to like the opposite side of teaching and that's what i was talking about at the end of my sort of very broken talk was that what it has done is that it has forced me i feel this whole situation to you know going going against the method that i would i would normally sort of use and uh, send pre recorded lectures and google classroom as you mentioned has been a life saver except uh, i would post things there except i was the only one posting things there you know i would ask students to reply or to engage and you know i'm i'm trying to think of like how what more i could do this time because last semester maybe even they were a bit sort of you know um frazzled fruzz, um, by what was happening but yeah. what happened often was that i'd keep sending you know like links and powerpoints i in fact even developed a game so there's this a uh, quizlet on which you can make games and get them to you know um, destroy meteorites that come in with information and things like that mm. um it, and uh, one person very nicely replied saying oh this was great and i got to level 2 on hard or something or level 7 on hard and then i asked in class so oh, did you like it and they were like no nah. <laughs> so, so, hard know. to please no these young people are very hard to please there is so much yeah, to, yeah. yeah it's like some people like it and some people thought that it was a waste of time and it took some effort to make that game you know so i realized yeah. that all the things that i could do in class and feel like you know it was actually working when it comes to the digital platform for various reasons and maybe because right. they are stuck at home and doing and and even in a normal classroom i think sometimes they have 24 hours of class a week and i'm yeah. not sure when they find time to actually read when they and especially yeah. if they're commuting and you mentioned the problem of commute yeah. and i just think this is a major problem it, for us students yeah. because far away yeah. and we, we have five lectures a day so they hardly have yeah, time so, to read so finally they're saying we can finally read books <laughs> exactly so that that was one of the pros you know of the asynchronous mode as they called it is that you know they have all the videos there and they also uh, they told me that they can actually um, speed it up to two times except mine they couldn't speed beyond 1.25 because i talked too fast um, <laughs> but you know some of the lectures you know they told me that they could speed up to 2x and that means that uh, they could finish an hour lecture in half an hour and uh, sometimes they could listen to it twice if they felt like like it um and and um they had a variety of sources so there there were some pros to this asynchronous yeah. mode in fact the, but on the other hand as it as somebody who is offering the material i'd really feel that it has uh, i mean now i'm sending them youtube videos and they can watch it but then i realized when i asked in class when i did a survey that maybe like two or three of them would watch it you know in a mm-hmm. huge class they would well, not now you can set assignments watch. you can make it mark <laughs> Sorry, you were talking about this. This no, you you're opposed to this. I know you were saying you don't like this whole yeah. power of marks, but. <laughs> I also, I mean, but even setting assignments is the only way of kind of you know these punitive measures of kind of you know. It's so horrible, it. though, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> really sad. But there is no easy translation. I, I between yeah. you know 
classroom situation, a physical classroom, and as you pointed out, and, and an online class, because I had to kind of reorient my course and rethink also in terms of the material that I'm supplying. For in instance, you know, there are books that I would otherwise kind of read with them, and they do not have an e-copy of it. So now I'll have to do something else. And, and because students nowadays are not very interested in buying books, and we are always, you know, uh, we have the responsibility of supplying them with material from time to time. So the, if there is, I mean, I cannot kind of provide them with, you know, even if it's, you know, out of copyright, I cannot provide them with, uh, let's say, photocopies at this point of time. So I'll have mm -hmm. to kind of think of using material which is conducive for uh, online teaching. And that's quite a bit of a trouble. But, uh, you know, at this point, we have uh, quite a few questions. So we'll move to the questions directly. Uh, the first question is directed to Bibo, but I would also like Maya to address if uh, she is willing. And I have a specific question for Maya uh, as well. So, uh, Dibu, if you could take it. Uh, why don't we start with Maya? Should we start with Maya and then maybe I'll come back to it? Okay. Yeah, no, I think, uh, Nirvala, you've totally just spot on, right? The point is that we moved away from delivery, the idea that there is this finite body of knowledge that we're just passing on, right? The fact that people are negotiating not just whatever we call knowledge, but the fact that reality is evolving and changing so much that I don't even think we make it cohere anymore, right? There is this need to kind of co-produce knowledge. And that's mm -hmm. clearly what all this sort of digital stuff that we're talking about, right, in terms of joining a podcast, you know, in media stress or whatever is doing. So I think the tools and our reality are so distinct that we need to acknowledge that we have to change our way of doing things. Yeah. No, my uh, thanks, Nirmala, for the question. It just reminds me of the book chapter we wrote recently together on BH pedagogy, where Nirmala kept dropping such co comments on the word document and saying, like, define yourself. What are you doing? So, yeah, but I think you know, as Maya's rightly put, but I think the key point here is how I locate knowledge. I locate knowledge always as a negotiation. So I don't know, locate knowledge as a stable signifier. It's a free floating signifier, which is always based in negotiation, which is why diisomatic, which is self-generating is always the perfect model to understand knowledge, especially why when we are questioning anglomeric in epistemes of DH, rhizome is such a beautiful metaphor. It's because it's self-generating. It doesn't have to tie into older canons, older traditional structures, right? which also leads me to one quick point which is unable to make in the uh, short time for the presentation. That, uh, for example, I don't expect my students who are in a management institution to become digital humans. Right? That's, that's not an expectation I have or do a PhD in DH or in literary studies or in social sciences. But what I expect them is to take that culture of conversation away from the tradition of humanities. And if this assignment helps them do that, then that's what I give. And an added bonus is McKinsey's last report has said that people in the creative industry are going to have a 129% rise in jobs. So just putting it in context. Uh, so I have a question for Maya and Big Boy again. Uh, if Maya could take that first, because we have worked with this for quite some time now, you know, some of the challenges of digital humanities in India, so we could kind of very briefly, it's, I know it's a very blanket question, but you could briefly touch upon some of the challenges that you're facing right now in uh, developing these digital humanities departments in India. Yeah, I don't think we are at that stage yet. We don't have any such departments. As Divya said, he's at a management school. You know, it's really a series of techniques, right? It's the way cultural studies offered open a whole new set of conversations. So the challenges, of course, in the first instance are funding. I mean, clearly, universities don't necessarily think of arts departments as places that need technology, right? So they're not right, queuing up to give us any money anytime soon about, you know, creating bigger projects. But also, I think in terms of uh, the way it's functioned in the US, where it, there's been a very robust ecosystem of digital libraries, digital librarians, right? Here, we're constantly learning on the job. And it's tough, you know, but the fact is, just like with this post COVID situation in education, right? instead of sort of lamenting the fact that there isn't funding or there isn't other technical support, the idea is what can you do with this? And I think because our need, and this is what I try to emphasize in my very choppy talk, sorry, was just that there is such immense near real world need for cultural archiving, for sort of Indian stories to be told in other languages, right? That given the need, how can our students not be part of this conversation? Right, especially humanities students uh, in India. And can we kind of make them also skilled up because the fact is many students get their first jobs in social media management or that sort of stuff, right? And in doing these things, they often are learning those techniques. 
so we are all learning in these open source platforms but i do believe we are becoming sort of future ready as we do that so i hope that yeah sort of we get you know recognized for doing what that work entails thank Divya? you would you like me to add on to that yeah please if you want to please, please. yeah yeah so i i think two points is two prong one is infrastructural issues and i see some questions in the youtube chat about libraries so i'm just going to direct you to two places one is the national digital library of india and the shodh ganga which are two resources which you can use in covid times there's also multiple uh, you know legal platforms like mit's ocw right which is open courseware this is a fantastic resource and i'm only talking of legal open access right uh, secondly of challenges there are many one is digitizing when you are because india exists in a weird transition between qualitative and quantitative dh so on one hand archive digitization while a bichitra exists and a project madurai exists there's also multiple uh, departments that are trying to take up dh institutionally so there was shishti there's obviously presidency the privileged places uh, iims the iits and iit jodhpur is starting a phd in dh it's the first phd in this country in dh right but along with these smaller places have also been doing great dh work for the last 20 years or so so let's start by acknowledging that dh is regional right dh doesn't only exist in the iit iims the flames or the isas right it exists in very small ecologies where they may don't identify as self hum digital humanists like self identify so acknowledging them is one major challenge which and deterritorializing again going into that very delusion gotarian framework right deterritorializing this is not this is not my discipline i'm not here to own it i'm here to open it up and the second part is uh, for example the hack versus yak debate right i just talked about this in uh, a couple of weeks ago there is the hack debate which is about who does the computing and the yak about who creates the cultures of conversation again this is lingo borrowed from anglo american dh so don't give us that right we will create our own own hack and yak debate and a wonderful example is shugoto mitro's hole in the wall experiment which i talked about a little while earlier and lastly things like osia which needs to exist for in indic text needs to be far better right right now good osia i'm not saying osia doesn't exist but good osia for indic text is missing and uh, lastly this idea of uh, hack also requires people to do things by their hands and upper class upper caste indian men have a colonial legacy and the caste legacy by which we believe in do it for me right it's not diy do it yourself so that legacy needs to be challenged in the class pedagogically as well so yeah quick answer so yes there was a question for aditi can you see the question aditi uh, yes it. it's about uh, equality and uh, question of class caste gender access digital divide and online teaching well complicated question and i would um, I, i'll i'll try sort of you know talking about it i'm i obviously don't have a solution but i can talk about what i would think would be you know a, a, a way forward and i'd be very happy if other people can add to it as well so i suppose i i, I suppose first thing would be to take a, a multiple pronged approach out here so um, there there are few issues with the with we are talking about digital access per se in this case and uh, i will not sort of differentiate in the case of class caste gender access it, i i'll just say people who have you know access to live lectures they have maybe uh, good mobile data or wifi and people who don't and who cannot access live lectures and um, and this is what we were talking about in the discussion earlier as well is the synchronous asynchronous model now um, i would say that for a kind of for the kind of teaching that i have done so far you know there was no possibility of an asynchronous model per se well apart from the fact that i always had projects in every class so i i did not like as i said i did not like assessments in the sense of exams i actually hate exams i hate giving exams taking exams you know uh, so uh, but what i did try to do was to have students do projects uh in which the students would um and it didn't uh, and one of the rules for the project was that it should be something not covered in the syllabus right uh, so um, the idea was that we are covering lots of things in the syllabus and this was in delhi university where i did not make the syllabus um uh, and so we were covering things for you know the 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 boss the man right and uh, the rest of it in the classroom was our safe space where all of us would talk about something that we were passionate about that something that you know and 
in fact you know the students often chose topics of you know class caste gender and um, they would develop these projects and try and uh, think of and and they would do their own reading they would do their uh, own sort of you know and they uh, they would come up we would have class discussions we had tutorials and i'm just uh, thinking you know like for the next semester of online teaching if this could be transferred to online teaching and this is something which is pretty low tech it doesn't actually require you know uh, live attendance of classes constantly and um, it also might uh, help with the problem of isolation that people feel who are, don't have very good access to to sort of you know internet to attend live classes and so what there are a couple of things so i'll i'll just try and think of it in a in a systematic way and explain it so first thing is live classes right so we need to we need to make live classes not compulsory so we should have live classes but we need to make sure that live classes are not compulsory and there is no stakes if people miss it yes some people will take advantage of that and bunk it but then some people will take advantage and bunk like real classes in you know in the room you know i'm also not very fond of this whole attendance business in which you know i check who is there like a policeman you know so so um i think i think first thing that i would say is that live classes should you know it they should happen and you would be surprised at how many people do voluntarily turn up even though there is no stakes uh, for these live discussions so there is that uh, so live classes should not be compulsory first uh, second i think continuous assessment and low stakes continuous assessment is really important which means that you know students should feel that i'm engaging with their work constantly and they they get continuous feedback and that you know they 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 are not marked harshly the the problem with the recorded space and a live space in in a sense is that it's not a safe space anymore as all of us will attend a test right now as well a classroom like so far i mean i'm not saying what's going to happen in the future it's pretty dystopian like from by some views um a classroom is a safe space in which you know all of us get together and we we speak we dialogue yeah. and we have discussions without you know this necessary feeling of you know being stupid or being judged uh and and uh, it's part of you know part of my work as a teacher really to create that atmosphere where nobody feels like you know anything they ask is stupid nobody feels that they are being judged you know and if some students do start out feeling that way but you know you there are ways of making sure that people don't feel that way and um so in digital spaces if you know this rec this recorded thing creates this problem of you know feeling stupid i think that can be dealt with by leaving students the possibility of you know like for example in google classroom that you were talking about earlier prayag uh, we have the option of you know posting on the wall that everybody reads but also posting privately uh, to the teacher and saying oh does it look fine and i'm like yeah this looks great do post it on the wall you know yeah. so that other people and so so um, to create this kind of peer network and to create a kind of space in which and 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 that's what i keep sort of you know coming back to is that you know nothing should be made compulsory you know everything should be made voluntary everything should be made and and yes please do use video lectures please do post video links you know but you know make sure that people don't feel like you know if they miss that they are losing out on everything you know they they can't follow the class anymore um, there there should be alternatives there should be options for them to come back to it later there, sh there should be options for them let's say in the whole day they don't have good internet or they are busy with like people coming in you know then maybe in the in the evening you know or at night they can access it so yeah. so there is this problem of access that we can we can deal with by by going towards this asynchronicity so that would be my solution at the moment but i i would like the others to say something as well on this no i agree and uh, i mean it actually ties in to this question that's on the screen right now so if i could kind of sort of yes, tie so. the things together uh yes i mean i agree with aditi in that uh, ideally making things non compulsory you know you can watch it later you don't have to record the problem that many of us may be facing in this regard is our institutional parameters you know the the framework of rules and regulations that our individual institutions frame and not just my own so to what extent can our own pedagogical uh, choices our own philosophies of teaching uh, be given scope within these institutional parameters that's it's a, it is a problem but uh, with Ur urunima's question how do micro expressions translate online not very well unfortunately this is the short answer is that not very well 
uh, what can we do about it? You can try to pay attention. I mean, I, I just try to you know pay attention to the video screens and try to pick up on them as best I can. And I suppose the other thing I could say is that speak up. I'll, I'll always encourage my students, and I know it takes confidence, and I know it's problematic in some ways, but you know, since I can't tell whether you're following or not as easily, please interrupt me, all right? Put something in the chat. The chat itself is a challenge because it can be distracting, but you know, put something in the chat or unmute yourself, okay? So that's it because you know these micro expressions they don't translate well online. Now the other question I'm a little bit more hazy on, but classroom protocol and how this translates online. So how do you make sure everyone is comfortable? I understand this is a problem. Many people may not be comfortable with the video on. Another thing about this video is that it's intrusive. It it focuses on your face. Many people may not like their own faces. Okay, this is something that has come up uh, among students that they don't feel very happy with their faces on screen. It's very face centric. Have you noticed? I mean, in a classroom, I'm quite far away. You know, it's my entire body here. You know, and many of us have not worn trousers in months. I have to, well, maybe oversharing over here. But the point is, it's all it's my face. You know what I mean? And this may make students feel uncomfortable. Maybe they may not like their face. So my solution to that is that. Again, I might be contradicting myself because I just talked about how it's nice to have this, the video on so that I can at least get some sense of your reactions. But hey, if you are uncomfortable with your face being on screen, I know it's being recorded as well. So just switch your video off, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you that. We do give you that choice in, in St. Xavier's. So that's one way to make sure people are comfortable. Uh, what else? Just try to chat, talk to people. If you have any issues, please speak up. Uh, I sometimes feel that I intimidate students. I accidentally, I don't mean to. I've been told this, but you know, and I can understand that 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 might be exacerbated in the classroom, in the online classroom. So, but please, students, some of you are watching this, you know, unmute yourselves, post on the chat group, make yourself feel comfortable to whatever extent possible. So, yeah. Dibbo, you had something to add? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add that uh, while we all come from you know, relatively separate backgrounds in our kind of work, we still don't have someone from the sciences. So it'll be interesting to see how they are doing digital pedagogy. Because for yeah, me, that's a very black key board. Point. I mean, we don't yeah. in English. We don't need the board much. But yeah, yeah. Onko Kore. I mean, yeah. how do you do ma maths on without? Yeah, I, I, I could add something there actually. So I taught yeah. logic last semester, and I needed a whiteboard, and that that meant that I had about like eight hours extra preparation per class. Because, <laughs> because are, you, are you using the Wacom tablets or one of those tablets? So no. So I was using I was using like you know I, I, I don't want to name brands, but in this case I was using an iPad with a with the Apple Pencil. Right. Right. Uh, but then uh, the problem was that you know with the with this Google uh, thing that we had, you know, it didn't integrate very well, which meant that I was uh, I was uh, screen recording all the solutions to the to the logical problems, you know. So it was like pages and pages of screen recording, hours and hours really of screen recording, and then um, screen sharing it on Google, and and that worked pretty well because you know I would pause and play, so I would pause after one step, and then I would ask the class, so what would the next step be? So you know that was one way of making it interactive. But that did add preparation time like crazy, you know. But then uh, I thought, well, this is the first time I'm doing it. I, I might as well try it. But I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that people, you know, in maths and physics and, you know, mm -hmm. th those who had to do proofs, like like in logic, I had to do proofs. So, you know, I had a similar issue. So it was a lot of preparation. And uh, the screen is recording. The tab is the, using a tab with a stylus is the apparently what most people are doing. Yeah, that's what I did, but I had to pre-record it, unfortunately, okay. because of the problem with Google. You know, so I think uh, in, in, on certain sort of platforms, it would have been, you know, I could have done it live, and that would have been so much better. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ways of um, dealing with that. Sorry, yeah, just interrupted. So yeah. we take one yeah. last question, and that's all. Uh, if you could address that, Dibbo. Yeah, I am happy to address it. So this is the, while I'm not going to go into details because this is a DH specific question, which can be taken at a later offline forum. So this was the essay that came out from Moretti in the 2011 edition of New Left Review, if I'm not mistaken. So it talked about how characters could be, this was network analysis in basic form, how characters could become nodes or vertices and the conversations in Hamlet could become the edges. And that's how he was trying to model it. And the limitations are also very well pointed out by Moretti. So that essay is available online. I'm more than happy 
to do online please. or offline chats on this. I'm so, teaching Shuja as my student and I'm teaching Hamlet this semester. So please send it to me as well. Absolutely. Absolutely happy to. And all the critiques of that, I'll also send it to you. Okay. So uh, there's another question, if you could just, uh, anybody can actually so address this. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Jana is a yeah. Dr. Jana is a is a colleague and a fellow journey you know, on on the a fellow in the journey with us fellow colleague in the journey on DH. So what are the possibilities of using digital archive depositories like National Manuscript Mission and the like as case studies in the terms of digital? That's a fabulous question. I think they must be used. I think uh, if a Dr. Jana would be uh, better placed to uh, you know point out point this out. Uh, I think they should be used. I still haven't used them in my classes. But I still, I strongly believe that epigraphy and uh, you know scripts and digitization of regional uh, regional areas and regional scripts is very important. And we must integrate national manuscript mission. I think I'll pass on to Maya because she's done the service learning model to a large extent. So Maya, if you want to take this question up as well. Yeah, Dr. Jana, I think uh, not much material in the National Manuscript Mission is publicly available, and that might relate more to people in archaeology, art history, like certainly specific uh, areas. But in the meantime, to create assignments around what's available, and there's a lot of stuff available right now, right? People have actually opened up their digital archives with COVID. Uh, and you know whether you're doing let's say history of health stuff there's the welcome trust whether i mean literally for every area there is one such thing um i can point you to a resource called south asian uh, culture.wordpress which has a list of archives and many of us can use and dip into these different repositories for just, just to assignments. add on there's this fantastic right? we can, uh, web, website or resource called zooniverse zooniverse allows for real-time collaboration on mm -hmm. live research projects so i think it's time we start integrating you know, could you like spell that. that out in the chat? Yeah, what's it yeah. yeah sure. Zooniverse, Z O O, and then you know, universe, right? Zooniverse. And what is it for exactly? It's kind of for live digital archival projects that you can crowdsource people to come in and work on. So it's a very interesting, uh, yeah, very interesting resource. So uh, I, I believe we do not have any more questions. And it's time that we wrap up as well. Let's not forget it's a weekend. And uh, this is something that, you know, COVID has done to us, particularly to our students. They are constantly running from one conference to another. So they have classrooms. I mean, uh, they have lessons to cover even in their weekends. Uh, and I feel really sorry for them at times because, you know, now it's literally 24-7 uh, for them. For us, uh, as anyway, well. for, for us, us as well. Yeah. For us as well. Yeah. There, there are no weekends. <laughs> uh, there are no weekends, and also uh, the other thing is we're also constantly digitally policing them with something or the other over the weekends and within the weekdays. So that's kind of uh, taxing. For uh, I mean, uh, certainly we do not like uh, this sort of you know this kind of constant uh, you know, digital surveillance through assignments through whatever it is. But that's how things are for the time being. So please bear with us. Uh, uh, but that's it from us today. So we have addressed a spectrum of questions through this digital adda, so if I may put it, because it is more like an adda because of all the little distractions that we had in between. So in fact, the distractions- No chai. <laughs> no, no chai, no chai though. Um, so yeah. Um, with, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot thank to all so the Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much. Aditi, um, Aditi, Maya, and Prayag. Thanks a lot. Hopefully, we're going to have more sessions like this, you know, in the future. Uh, thanks Absolutely. to Shangla and thanks, thanks to all the participants, uh, the students who have attended it. Hopefully, you have, you know, got some, you know, cues, some kind of help from the, you know, the session. Uh, I have learned quite a lot, in fact. So, uh, thanks once again to all of, all of you. And uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you so bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. bye, -bye.